We will now reconvene the uh, City of Boynton Beach City Commission's meeting today, Tuesday, October 15th at 6.30 p.m. Would everyone please rise for an invocation led by Woodrow Hay after a moment of silence for the passing of our city, uh, Assistant City Manager, Tim Howard. Let us pray. Loving and gracious Father, you are indeed the giver of all good gifts. And we thank you this evening for all of your blessings. Thank you for the privilege to serve. We ask that you bless our mayor and all the commissioners of Boynton Beach. We are grateful for our city manager and the many men and women that serve this great city. Allow matters of business to be conducted decently and in order, and that it would be pleasing in your sight. Guide our hearts and our minds, dear Lord, in the spirit of fairness right thought and speech. Impart your supreme wisdom upon our activities so that our decisions may reach a successful conclusion. Again, we thank you, Father, for your leaders that we are able to work together to move this city to the next level. We indeed pray a special prayer for our beloved life of our brother Tim Howard. And we lift up his family in their time of bereavement. For you said in your word that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal the land. Thank you, Lord, for being our source of guidance. We ask all of these blessings in your Savior's name. And all the people of God said, Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May the, the record reflect that I, uh, my attendance is now here. And Mayor, also that you uh, were in attendance at the closed door session uh, before it began All at right. uh, 540. All right, thank you. Um, any additions, solutions, or corrections to the agenda? I'd like to add um, under, at the beginning of announcements, uh, an informational notice from our water department regarding the precautionary boil water notice that was issued this past week. And also I have uh, two announcements of events that are going on, um, the, the renaming of the VFW and uh, the Boynton Cares that is on next month that I'd like to speak about at the end of the announcements. Second. All those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, motion, the, uh, motion to pass the agenda is approved unanimously. On to informational items by members of the City Commission. Vice Mayor, would you like to begin? Um, no informational items to disclose, but I wanted to offer my condolences, obviously, to Tim's family and friends. I had the pleasure to, to work with him over the past four or so years, and he was, he was a professional, and Everyone respected him because he did his job and he did it extremely well. So, um, you know, as far as, as working with people, that's what you would hope and expect for. And he excelled at everything he did. So, again, to his family and friends, my condolences. Commissioner McCraig. Thank you, sir. I, too, would like to offer condolence to the family of Mr. Howard. 
I had the pleasure of working with probably longer than anyone else sitting up here. I'm just saying he was truly a, a gifted person when it came to the knowledge of finance, gifted, and also his endeavors as an assistant city manager to this city. I'd like to say to our city manager, Ms. Laveria, you know, along with the staff of the city of Boynton, you know, as the heads of this helm, we're praying with you all that you all could get a little stronger. I'm just saying I know this week is going to be crying and trying for all of you, but we will see you all through. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Penserga. I have nothing to disclose, but I do want to add that my heart is with the family of Tim and all of his colleagues. I did not have the pleasure to know him as deeply as the others, being that I'm the newly elected. Um, but from my interactions with Tim, he was nothing but a good and decent person, and I wish I could have only known him better. Um, so my heart goes out to everybody that knew him, and he's someone I wish I had the chance to get to know. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, so one of the, the good things is, is that uh, on October 2nd, we had our topping off party, and Laura, you were able to show him the picture of the beam that was up there, and you, you know, see him smile, because you know, this was his work, and this was his life, for over 10 years. Um, I remember meeting him for the first time on the Financial Advisory Committee. And it was, he was, you know, it was always nice to have someone who knew all the rules. And that's kind of what Tim is, is that if you had a question about the rules, Tim would know, and if he didn't know, he'd find out very quickly, but most of the time he knew already. And so he will be missed because of all the things that he knew and all the things that he gave to our city to be a better city. Um, on the, the 5th of October, I attended uh, the tree giveaway from Community Greening. Um, it was an amazing event. We gave out over 200 trees, and I saw the, the map, and so they went as far south of Miami up to Port St. Lucie, but the majority of them were in Boynton Beach. I went to Troop 395's uh, public, uh, one of their sessions, and spoke to them at uh, for them have an opportunity to speak to an elected official. I attended uh, a Circles interview uh, with over at Pathways to Prosperity. Uh, I wished every, I hope everyone had an easy fast for Yom Kippur. On October 10th, I was at Ocean Avenue for the installation of our new Avenue of the Arts. Um, we no longer have the Kinetic Arts installation, and so I'm looking very much forward to our exhibition and to see how great our Arts Commission does. Um, on the 11th, we met with uh, members of Brightline um, in regards to uh, making our uh, railroad safer in Boynton Beach, and we had some great ideas, and we look forward to working with Brightline. Um, I had a meeting with the mayors of Boca and Del Rey, so I didn't have to travel to Hawaii to meet with other mayors like some other um, mayors in Palm Beach County did. <laughs> and uh, then on the 12th, I attended the FAU game, and the city of Boynton Beach was recognized as one of the, the people there. It was a great game. It was great weather. And uh, I look forward to doing it again next year and getting more people. And today, I attended a ground ba uh, breaking over at the Bible Church of God for the, the Banks Living Legacy uh, Community Garden, working with the uh, University of Florida Extension over at Mount's Botanical Garden. Is there any other uh, informational items before we move on to announcements? Our first announcement is from the Water Department regarding the precautionary boil water notice and everything that led up to that and everything that led after that. So thank you, Mayor, Assistant City Manager Colin Groff. I'll, I'll keep this brief because um, I think everybody is aware the, the, water, the utility department had an incident on Tuesday uh, can you hear me now? Okay, I'm going to get it closer. Okay, there we go. Much better. Uh, on Tuesday, uh, during a full load test of a generator, when the generator was switched off after a successful test to move to go back to FPNL power at the plant, a large breaker failed to operate and move the power back. So the generator was turned off. The power did not come on from FPNL due to an electrical failure within the breaker. Staff spent about two minutes trying to reset the breaker by hand. They could not do it. Then they immediately notified um, the other plants to start, the other plant operators to start turning on pumps within our system to maintain pressure. 
Um, so there was, we did that, and about 10 minutes after that, so they, they started turning on pumps. It took about two minutes to get pumps turned back on. And uh, at the time, they were not aware that pressure dropped in the system. They just knew that the plant was offline, so we brought in our other resources that are available in that case when plants are offline. Those are planned options. Uh, we, the city started receiving complaints about low pressure uh, from, from customers about 10 to 15 minutes later. Um, that prompted staff to start reviewing data and determined over the next 30 to 40 minutes that there were five or six points within our system that we measure pressure throughout our system that did drop below the 20 PSI. So when that occurs, staffs, the, the standard operating procedure staff then looks at what, you know, where did it occur, what happened, what are all the data points, and about, I'm using plus or minus 15, 20 minutes here, about 2.30 in the afternoon they determined that there, there was a pressure drop in the system and we operate under a permit from the state of Florida to operate these plants and within that permit there are certain requirements. One of them is if the utility has any inclination that there could be a problem with the system, we fall under the guidelines uh, from the Department of Health for boil water notice guidelines. And in those guidelines, it gives very, coming from state statutes, gives very specific guidelines on what we have to do when we have these situations. So the first thing staff did was call Department of Health. Department of Health is responsible for authorizing any of these uh, instances. Um, so when we called Department of Health, they spent some time on the phone discussing incident, talking about the data, figuring out, and jointly they decided that uh, out of the abundance of cautious, cautious, cautiousness, caution, the caution, thank you, sorry, it's been a long day today, uh, out of the abundance of caution that um, it would be, it might be advisor, uh, advisable to issue a system-wide advisory notice that we had an issue. Um, the law does not require us to do that. Uh, we, by the minimum standards in the law, uh, based on the information we had at that time, we could have just notified some very specific customers that we had a problem, such as hospitals, uh, dialysis centers, and things like that. But based on the evidence we were looking at, we said, you know what, we, we want to be a transparent city. We want to tell people what's happening. So about 2.30, 3 o'clock, we decided that that was the right thing to do with the health department. The law then requires us to write the notice and then get clearance from the health department before that notice goes out. So about 4, 4.15, we got approved from the health department to submit the boil water notice. Uh, that went to between utilities and our marketing department. Uh, we, we discussed it to determine the best way to get it out. The statutes allow, give us three options to get information out. The first one is, is we can go out and notify uh, customers individually with door hangers. That's what we do every week. When we, we have boil water notices every week in the city. They're generally very small. They, they're caused by line breaks, by construction projects, maintenance projects, and sometimes just individually at a house. And so this is a routine process the utility uses, but generally it's a very small area with very few customers, so we use door hangers. When we have 112,000 customers and about uh, 70,000 connections, there was no physical way to do door hangers. You could not do that in... 48 hours with as many people as we needed out there to do that. So that was not, that was not an option. The second option you have is you can notify people by telephone. Um, the problem in our utilities is we have 35,000 accounts, but we have 112,000 customers because a lot of our accounts have multiple customers because they're HOAs that get a single bill, they're apartment buildings that get a single bill, condominiums that get a single bill. So we don't have access to all of our customers that way. Um, we did discuss reverse 911, but this did not, this was, did not rise to the level of emergency. And I'm going to read you something here real quick, what, what they say under this type of situation. So we decided to use the press, which is the third option we have, so is a press release. So we wrote the press release, released it at about 4.30 to 24 press agencies that impact Boynton Beach. That immediately went out to the public. Um, it was very, very quickly. We also used all of the city's social media uh, sites to post that data. Again, that's not required, but we chose to do it to try to get to as many people as possible. Um, so we did that. And I, so what we were under, if you, in, in the rules that we follow, we were under a low water pressure thing. And what, it, what the rule says, a drop in water pressure in a water distribution system is a signal of existence of conditions which could allow contamination to enter the, the system through a backflow device. So there's a potential that it could. That's why we chose to do it. Because when you lose pressure in certain areas, there is a, there, there is a potential, and we want to err on the side of caution. Um, but it also says that we're not, it, it's a precautionary notice is not 
required in that case unless certain conditions are met. And we, we didn't actually meet those conditions, but we were close. So in our case, I made the call to do the system-wide boil water notice. And when you do that, the next step is then we take samples system-wide. We took 105 samples at 105 sampling points throughout the city. Those take 24 hours to test. So we knew we had 24 hours of a system-wide. Uh, at, at the end of 24 hours, when they come back clear, now what we're testing for is bacteria. Um, and, we're t and the bacteria we're testing for is naturally occurring bacteria. So um, is there a potential health risk? There's always a potential health risk with anything. Um, but it's something that everybody has in their system, so it's not an emergency statement. So that's the process we went through. We, we believe we, we, we met. One of the things we do in the notice is say, please tell your neighbors if you don't think they have access to data. That's one of the things we ask. And most of the phone calls we got, people understood that they need to tell their neighbors. So we did get some complaints about why didn't we use reverse 911. That's because it was not emergency and we did not activate our EOC. So we're not going to use uh, reverse 911 in that case. And why did we choose the media? We chose the media because that has the biggest impact. Most, a lot of people have their, have text alerts and everything. And you can do that if you're interested in text alerts. So if anything in your area comes from the media, you'll get alert that it says. So that's, and in all of the different ways we have to do it, that is the absolute best way to do it. I am happy to say that we found no contamination anywhere in the system. The system was completely cleared. So there was not a hazard. This was, again, it was cautionary because we didn't know until we finished the testing. So any questions? Um, my quick question is, is that they were able to, you were able to send out an email to a lot of people so that were the, the water notice was, was rescinded. Um, my only suggestion for next time is to send out that press release to the, the same email list. Yes, absolutely, and that was, that was uh, just an oversight at the beginning. We, did not think, we didn't think about that when we first submitted out because we were concentrating on the media. So we didn't think about that. But once we, we, once we thought about that, we have about 12,000, 9,000 or 12,000 email addresses. So we did get it. about 12,000 email addresses. So we did start doing that as soon as we realized that that was a tool. And we also started using Nextdoor, which also has about 9,000 customers on it. So once we realized we could get more contact to people using those, we started using it. And so that's going to go into our standard operating procedure to use that every time. Again, out of trying to the abundance of, of transparency. We want to use all the methods we have available. All right. Commissioner McCray. Thank you. Colin, this is for you. I'm glad to know at this time that we have guidelines not in place if this happens again. That's number one. Second of all, just clarification, not only for myself but for the citizens that's here tonight, was at any time, was any of our citizens' lives, pets, or any part of their household ever in danger because of this? So. I cannot say, I, I do know now, no, they were not. Thank you. Because sir. we tested the system. At the time, we could not say that because we, we did not, we had not finished the test. So until you finish the test and the tests are clear, you cannot say that. But now we can. We finished the test, and yes, there was no danger to anybody in the system. You, you know, I'm going to say this coming from Georgia. I'm just saying, many years we was raised on well water. I'm just saying, out of the ground. And we didn't know anything about chloride and all chlorine or whatever it is now, but you know, I think we came out pretty good, so I'm just saying, you know, as long as you've got guidelines in place. Yeah, all the bacteria we test for is naturally occurring bacteria that's in every human being. Thank you. It's sir. just when they're in the water system, they can cause, for certain people with certain things, if you have enough of it, which we didn't, again, but if you did, it could cause some, um, you know, a minor temporary illnesses. So that's why we give the process you notice. So if somebody knows that they may be susceptible to that kind, they can make that decision on their own of what they want to do. I didn't check my emails that day, but that morning, uh, the news thing off of the news that said Boynton has a boil water notice. And I'm like saying, huh? You know, it really got my attention. I'm just saying, like, it got mine. It got a lot more citizens. And I appreciate the citizens that did call me to find out, is it affecting my district? Is it affecting my household? Is it safe to drink? I'm just saying we was in communication with those that did call. I'm, I'm just saying, you know, but I'm glad that, you know, you all handled it in a professional manner. And right after that, you know, Wellington, they had a ball water notice. So I don't know what was happening, you know, during this month. Like, it was a hiccup in everybody's system. But I'm glad everything went okay. Thank you. All right. Board Member Pinsergo. First, I'd like to commend staff. And given the situation, it was precautionary, and everybody was acting out of an abundance of caution and transparency. You know, in this day and age, I think people expect that they receive information immediately, similar to an Amber Alert. Yes, I understand this did not arise at the level of an emergency, but I do want to commend you for doing everything you could, given the circumstances and given the guidelines that you have legally. 
Um, now, prior to this, we've had conversations about some innovations that our city is doing to get the word out even faster. Uh, could you just give us a little preview of some innovations that we're doing? So one of the things we're excited about is we're getting re we're beta testing right now a new app called MyCivic. And, and again, it's a voluntary app that if you have a cell phone, it's a smartphone, and most people do, you can download the app and you can sign up. And that's a great way for the city to communicate with the citizens and the citizens to communicate with the city. So that's what that app is supposed to, is, is, is there for, to allow that two-way instantaneous communication. So we think that's going to be one of the best tools we have in the future. Now, we don't plan on have, ever having this again in the future. System-wide right. boil water notices are not common. They do happen. Most boil water Boil water notices are just very unique to a CIS space and generally due to a line break or construction. That's, and it happens, we do, we do do them, you know, pretty much every week. Uh, we have something happening in the system. But in this case, it would give, and it's not just for these kind of situations, also for hurricanes and other emergency events. It's a great, that's a tool that we hope that becomes a great way to, uh, that people can sign up and get instantaneous information and give it's something they have to opt in. So they have to opt in. Again, we use opt in for all of these because we, we have surveys that show people if they don't want to be called and they don't want text and they don't want emails, they don't want to be forced to take it. So these are all opt in options. Great. Thank you. All right. Yes, Vice Mayor. Just want to echo everyone's sentiment. It, you know, it was an emergency, so the expectation of some flawless, perfect response that would appease everyone is, is not realistic. That's the, the nature of an emergency is it's not predictable, um, but given the fact that it was precautionary, I appreciate that staff would rather have upset some people in an abundance of caution than said nothing and, and heaven forbid something had seriously happened that could have endangered health. People's jobs and lives would be on the line, so I, you know, it's, it's commendable for people to step in front of something and, and take hits to try to protect people than to, to hide behind it and wait for the fallout. So again, I commend everyone who was involved. All right. Yes, Board Ma uh, Commissioner McCray. Thank you. I'd like to say, you know, the next time if y'all could do the businesses first, because I went to get coffee from uh, Dunkin' Donuts and <laughs> yes. they didn't have any. So. <laughs> Ab absolutely. Yes. That's, you know, and I always wonder, you boil, you boil water to make coffee. I'm not sure why you couldn't drink coffee, but that's, well, they didn't give me any. that was a business decision on their part. So. And that's a separate database we're working yes. on with our, through our economic right. development efforts is, is building that distribution list and communication mode between, with all of our businesses from our business tax receipt. But, you know, these, there's no one database that has everybody in it. There's information in a million places. So, but that next time, because we, I think I understood some businesses actually closed. Yes, and they so. did not need to. And had, had, you know, we've been able to get that to them that may have been prevented. All right. I just want to make certain that yes. those businesses that we have on our BTR list were on the email distribution list. So, okay. so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Moving on to our next announcement. Uh, announce the new solo exhibit by Cecilia Lueza installed on Avenue of the Arts called Color Effects. Hello, Debbie Coles -de Bay, Public Art Manager. Um, my pleasure to announce the new Avenue of the Arts exhibition selected by our Arts Commission Board titled Color Effects. Color Effects is a solo exhibition by Cecilia Luisa, and it's consisting of five colorful geometric sculptures that are in East Ocean Avenue in downtown Point Beach. Um, these artworks promote community values, and they transform the streetscapes in East Boynton. The Avenue of the Art attracts visitors to our downtown, which increases cultural tourism, economic development, and jobs, creates jobs. Last week's installation already produced positive PR for the city with photographers and writers from the Palm Beach Post, the Sun Sentinel, and coverage on WPTV Channel 5 and the 6 o'clock news. In addition to our PR and marketing program, we're also partnering with the Cultural Council of Palm Beach County, as well as Discover the Palm Beaches, to promote cultural destination, which will highlight the city's new downtown growth in the town square. Visitors who sign up can take monthly volunteer docent-led tours that include free promotional area business opportunities. So we're connecting the businesses to this tour. Um, they can also take a self-guided talk tour, walkable in also with an Autocast app that they can download on their smartphone that connects them directly with the artists who can speak about each of the sculptures. And the exhibit and the tour is available by visiting boyntonbeacharts.org on the exhibit page 
on our website or by picking up this brochure, which is going out to print tomorrow, but I have a preview for each of you to have and a couple extras here. Um, I just want to highlight that this wonderful brochure was done by my assistant, Gina Berg, so give her a little bit of a credit for that, too. And it will be um, distributed in different uh, city facilities as well as the area businesses. Anybody have any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Our next announcement is by Police Chief Gregory about the Department's Commission for Florida Enforcement accreditation as an Excelsior level. Good evening, Commissioner, Mayor. Good evening. Got some company with me tonight. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit about our uh, accreditation process. Uh, I'll start. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, an accreditation program has long been recognized as a means of maintaining the highest standards of professionalism. Accreditation is the certification by an independent reviewing authority that an entity has met specific requirements prescribed by the standards. Schools, universities, and hospitals are some of the most well-known organizations that are required to maintain accreditation. In 1993, Florida State statute was created directing the Florida Sheriff's Association and the Florida Police Chiefs Association to create a voluntary law enforcement accreditation program statewide. Through a grassroots effort by the chiefs and sheriffs, law enforcement standards were developed and accepted by the Florida Law Enforcement Community and the Commission for Florida Law Enforcement Accreditation. CFA, as, it was, as it's referred to, is recognized as the premier state law enforcement accreditation program in the United States. The CFA is comprised of four chiefs, four sheriffs, and one representative from the State Law Enforcement Chiefs Association, the Association of Counties, the League of Cities, Florida Supreme Court, and the Chief Inspector General's Office. The Commission meets three times a year to oversee the accreditation process, I'm sorry, the accreditation program, and to officially accredit uh, agencies that have met and passed the rigorous review process. We are proud to announce that on Wednesday, October 2nd, this year, Boynton Beach Police Department was recognized by the Commission of Florida Law Enforcement Accreditation as an Excelsior agency. The CFA is a regional accrediting organization. There is no higher honor by a professional accrediting, accrediting body. The, accredit the recognition was granted by the Commission following an in-depth outside ex uh, examination of every aspect of our operations from August 2016 through July of 2019. The assessment was chaired by Lieutenant Matthew Fletcher from the Naples Police Department and he was assisted by Inspector Keith Riddick from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and Detective Sonia Wise from the Tampa Police Department. The assessment team conducted a variety of audits and inspections to ensure our practices are consistent with our policies. In addition, the assessors met with and interviewed and observed many of our personnel during the course of their daily work. The assessment team descri described our personnel as knowledgeable, courteous, and engaged. They were especially impressed with several aspects of our operations, including our innovative work with youth in, in the community, our engagement efforts both internally and externally, our social media presence, branding, and messaging, and our selection process with police training officer program. Excelsior recognition can only be achieved based on two conditions. First, the agency must dem demonstrate commitment to the accreditation process for a minimum of five three-year cycles. Additionally, the agency must demonstrate excellence with respect to the manner in which it performs based on the 237 individual benchmarks that are established by the commission. At this time, I would like to recognize Sergeant Christine Nolte and Detective Holly Picciano for their success in organizing and cataloging our proofs of compliance, their input on our policy development, and their efforts to help align our policies with our training uh, were outstanding. 
I would also like to recognize their commanding officer, Captain Maurice Spates, for his efforts in, in also leading the charge. Uh, I just have to say that the, uh, beyond the technical details of this, it, it, it was huge. It's a huge undertaking to get reaccredited uh, every three years. I mentioned there's uh, 237 of those policies. Every one of them needs proofs that we've done this and we've been training to what we teach. Uh, but beyond that, when you, we leave the police station that we were in before and move to a warehouse and try to recreate that environment, and, and most of you have been over there and seen where we're at, uh, without all of the infrastructure that's built into the station, it is three times the challenge to meet these standards. Uh, the requirements for, for booking cells, for holding areas, for evidence collection, for evidence storage, uh, our crime scene labs, our detective area, uh, all of the standards that we have to meet uh, were that much more challenged being inside a, uh, a temporary facility. Uh, we received a lot of, of recognition for that from the commission when I went up and, uh, with the team uh, to accept our, our uh, to be interviewed and then accept our reaccreditation. Uh, and, they, and many of them uh, passed on the compliments. So on my behalf, I need to pass on those same compliments to our public works department, which worked so closely with the team to meet the standards where we needed extra sheathing inside walls around evidence, where we needed extra fencing and barbed wire and extra gates, um, extra generator hookups to keep emergency power available for the facility, all those extra things that the team couldn't manually do themselves, the Public Works Department, uh, Andrew Mack and his folks stood up to help us accomplish that so they could document those proofs and evidence that we're meeting the standards and present that back uh, before the commission. So with that said, uh, finally, I'd like to surprise our two accreditation managers with a department commendation. And it reads as follows. On October 2nd, 2019, the Boynton Beach Police Department was recognized by the Commission for Florida Law Enforcement Accreditation for the second time as an Excelsior agency. This is the highest honor of achievement by a professional body and is awarded to the, those agencies that have demonstrated two key benchmarks, which I mentioned earlier in my remarks. The men and women of the Boynton Beach Police Department are dedicated to maintaining the highest standards in all areas of policing. We are determined to continue in our mission of building community trust, enhancing police training, increasing transparency through our social media presence, and creating new and improved programs that bring police and youth throughout the city of Boynton Beach together. The police department is committed to maintaining its core values while operating within our code of ethics. The Boynton Beach Police Department would like to recognize accreditation managers Sergeant Christine Nalty and Detective Holly Picciano for their, de their dedication, hard work, in helping to prepare our agency for reaccreditation. As part of achieving CFA recognition, the agency must comply with 237 individual benchmarks established by the commission. Sergeant Nalty and Detective Picciano were relentless in their efforts to ensure that our agency receives its second Excelsior recognition. Sergeant Nalty's six years of hard work and dedication to the Professional Standards Unit while ensuring that the agency maintains reaccredited status is greatly appreciated. Detective Picciano is newly assigned as our accreditation manager and has worked side by side with Sergeant Nalty since March in organizing and cataloging our proofs of compliance and giving input on policy development. As a result of their long working hours and meticulous work ethic, the agency successfully achieved its second Excelsior distinction. The Boynton Beach Police Department is, is one of only 56 police agencies out of the 390 in the state of Florida to hold this high honor. And we acknowledge the contribution of our two excellent accreditation managers. These two officers are exemplary, along with the 216 dedicated members of the Boynton Beach Police Department who represent excellence in police work every single day. Please join me in recognizing the team. Police chief, this is killing the fire chief, by the way. <laughs> Every little bit helps. <laughs> Thank you. Ciao. Any uh, questions from the board? Yes. Uh, yes. Board Member Romulus, Commissioner Romulus. I, I would just like to hear from the individuals just to introduce yourselves and say hello to everyone, please. Their favorite part. Yeah. Well, we've got to get them to the, the podium. 
<laughs> I'm Sergeant Nolte, Point Beach. I'm Detective Picciano. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Done. Commissioner McCray. Thank you. Chief, I'd like to say, first of all, you are a new police chief. I'm just saying, I don't know if you've been here over a year, but I'm, have you been here over a year? Yes. Sir. Yes. Oh, well, good. Okay, so we've seen fruits of your labor. But I want to be the first one to say congratulations, sir. When you stepped to the helm, you know, we, you didn't know what you was getting yourself into. When I interviewed you, I said, I went back and told the city manager I made up my mind. My mind was made up when I spoke with you. I'd just like to say to you and the police department here in this city, Safety is one of our first priorities for our citizens. Thank you for stepping up to the plate, stepping up to the ham, and making sure that we stay on track. When you get to your new police de department that's being built. New building, not new, new building. department. He's not leaving us, okay, hold on, pump the brakes. You're paying attention. New department, new police department. Building. 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 I voted for the building, okay? <laughs> I wanted the building over there, okay? I voted when the fire department went over there, okay, so we know who voted for it. Okay. I just want to say when y'all move in, continue the great works that you're doing now, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Congratulations. Our next announcement is uh, to receive a $30,000 donation from the Realtors Association of the Palm Beaches and Greater Fort Lauderdale for the enhancement of the area around the Eastern Pond at Barrier Free Park. Good evening, Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, Wally Majors, Recreation and Parks Director. I'm going to ask uh, the president of the Realtors Association of the Palm Beaches and Greater Fort Lauderdale, Jeffrey Levine, to join me. Um, when we began uh, our partnership with the uh, Realtors Association seven years ago, I never anticipated that we would continue to uh, be able to really uh, continue such a wonderful relationship and and for them to come forward and and support our our, our barrier free park and, and at this level is something that uh, i i am really excited about and i'm very proud to consider them very good friends of ours and and i'd like to allow mr levine to uh, say a few words i don't to give the check first i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> it's in the mail Good evening, Mayor Grant, May, um, Vice Mayor Katz, and the Boynton Beach City Commission. My name is Jeffrey Levine, and I'm the 2019 President of the Realtors of the Palm Beaches and Greater Fort Lauderdale. With me this evening is President-elect Jared Lowe, Southern Palm Beach County Regional Vice President J.D. McClintock, and Northern Palm Beach County Regional Vice President Jonathan Dolphus. Our association has partnered with the City of Boynton Beach Recreation and Parks Department for nearly a decade now on the Barrier Free Park, and we are proud to have witnessed its continued growth and progress. Realtors are more about more than just people who sell homes. They are advocates for their communities, and they help build and shape our neighborhoods. On behalf of the Realtors of the Association of the Palm Beaches and Greater Fort Lauderdale, we are honored to be here this evening to present you this check for $30,000 to help with the final phase of the Barrier Free Park. Wally, when's the next race? What's the date, February? It'll be the first February, uh, first Saturday in February. This will be our eighth annual, and uh, again, we're very proud to consider this wonderful organization a partner with us again. Thank you again. Thank you. Next, Mayor, yep. I'd like to ask a question, if that's all right, gentlemen. I have a quick question to ask. <laughs> First of all, thank you for being here and thank you for your donation and being a partner with the city. Could you just share a little bit about the origin story? What brought you to Boyne Beach and what brought you to this partnership? 
Yeah, it, it, go, it goes back many years before I was even involved in leadership in, within the uh, Realtor Association of Palm Beaches, which was our original um, association here locally. Uh, Danielle Bowen, who's our uh, one of our communications directors, um, she had, had taken on this project from day one of being with the, with the association. It's, you know, realtors are truly about what goes on in the community. It's, it, you know, our, if our communities are doing well, if, if our infrastructure is well, if our recreation and parks are well, well, guess what? It raises home prices. And we are happy as realtors <laughs> to be involved in that process. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sir, sir don't go, but uh, another phase that you did not know about was we had a commissioner that sat up here for years before his passing, and he partnered with you all. I'm just saying it was in his district, and he made sure that you all got involved, and he made sure that the Barrier Free Park was located in his district, so that's another part of history that you all need to know about. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for letting us know about that. What's his name, Lori? I forget. The white-haired. Ensler. Ensler. Thank you. Bob Ensler. Thank you. And we are looking forward to continue to being involved in the Barrier Free Project. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Our next announcement is a proclamation of October 13 to the 19, 2019 as Mediation Week in the City of Boynton Beach. City of Boynton Beach Proclamation. Whereas mediation is an informal and non-adversarial process in which a neutral and impartial third party aims to facilitate communication and negotiation between the disputing parties and to help them reach a mutually acceptable and voluntary agreement without prescribing what it should be. And whereas mediation and other voluntary collaborative dispute resolution processes provide effective alternatives to litigation and in court trials. And whereas alternative dispute regulation, resolution, ADR, including mediation, has been utilized by the Florida court system to resolve disputes for over 30 years, offering litigants court-connected opportunities to resolve their disputes without judicial intervention. And whereas the state of Florida is nationally recognized as a leader in the growing ADR field with one of the most comprehensive court-connected mediation programs in the country. And whereas mediators and other dispute resolution practitioners, through their con concentrated expertise in helping parties find lasting solutions to complex problems have continually demonstrated the value of alternative dispute resolution. And whereas the Palm Beach County Bar Association through its alternative dispute, dispute resolution committee seeks to promote the use and value of ADR processes to lawyers, the judiciary and the public and considers that these processes help parties resolve disputes without a trial in a less costly and more timely and satisfying manner. And whereas the American Bar Association has declared the third week in October as Mediation Week in celebration of the strides made in institutionalizing mediation as one of the several appropriate dispute resolution processes. And whereas mediation along with the principles and practices it embodies like self-determination as to process and outcome, open communication, collaborative problem solving can be a crucial tool for peacemaking between and among individuals, groups, units, neighborhoods and governments as well as in our workplaces. And whereas the City of Boynton Beach expressed its appreciation to the Palm Beach County Bar Association, and especially to the members of the ADR Committee for their efforts in promoting alternative dispute resolution throughout Palm Beach County. Now therefore, I, Stephen B. Grant, Mayor of the City of Boynton Beach, Florida, to hereby proclaim October 13th to the 19th, 2019, as Mediation Week. Uh, do we have someone to accept the proclamation? No. Next, we have proclaimed the month of October as National Arts and Humanities Month for the City of Boynton Beach. C City of Boynton Beach Proclamation. Whereas the month of October has been recognized as National Arts and Humanities Month by the nation's 4,500 local art agencies and the Arts and Humanities Councils of the 50 states and six U.S. jurisdictions, as well as by the White House and Congress for over 30 years. And whereas the Arts and Humanities embody much of the accumulated wisdom, intellect, and imagination of humankind, and whereas cities and states, through their local and state arts agencies and representing thousands of cultural organizations, have celebrated the value and importance of culture in the lives of Americans and the health of thriving communities during National Arts and Humanities Month for several years, whereas the humanities help diverse communities across the United States explore their history and culture. 
whereas the arts and culture industry also strengthens our economy by generating $166.3 billion in total economic activity, $26 billion in government revenue, and by supporting the full-time equivalent of 5 million jobs. And whereas the creative economy drives tourism and commerce, supports American workers, and makes up 4.3% of the annual GDP, proposal, proposed federal legislation titled the CREATE Act would support economic development of the creative economy. Whereas since October 5, 2005, the City of Boynton Beach adopted and supports its Art and Public Places program and through the guidance and authority of the Arts Commission has consistently recognized the importance of this industry. Now therefore, I, Stephen B. Grant, Mayor of the City of Boynton Beach, Florida, to hereby proclaim the month of October 2019 as National Arts and Humanities Month. Do we have someone to accept the proclamation? Debbie? Oh, Marcia. Marsha Levine, Arts Commission Vice Chair. I want to thank the mayors and the commissioners for supporting this program that's been serving our city since 2005. Just a simple thank you for everything that you do. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Our next proclamation is for October 15, 2019 as White Cane Safety Day in recognition of the growing independence and self-sufficiency of blind people in America and also to gain recognition of the white cane as the symbol of that independence and that self-reliance. Ted Goodenough, Assistant ADA Coordinator, will accept the proclamation. <coughs> City of Boynton Beach proclamation. Whereas the white cane, which every blind citizen of our of and in our city has the right to carry, demonstrates and symbolizes the ability to achieve a full and independent life and the capacity to work productively in competitive employment. And whereas the white cane, by allowing every blind person to move freely and safely from place to place, makes it possible for the blind to fully participate in and contribute to our society. And whereas every citizen should be aware that the law requires that motorists exercise appropriate caution when approaching a blind person carrying a white cane or guided by a dog guide. And whereas, Florida law also calls upon employers, both public and private, to be aware of and utilize the employment skills of our blind citizens by recognizing their worth as individuals and their productive capacities. And whereas, the City of Boynton Beach and our business community, with the cooperative assistance of the Lighthouse for the Blind of the Palm Beaches, can look forward to a continued expansion of employment opportunities for and, gr for and greater acceptance of blind persons in the competitive labor market. And now, therefore, I, Stephen B. Grant, Mayor of the City of Boynton Beach, Florida, to hereby proclaim October 15, 2019 as White Cane Safety Day in Boynton Beach and call upon our schools, colleges, and universities to offer full opportunities for training to blind persons upon employers and their, the public to utilize the available skills of competent blind persons and to open new opportunities for the blind in a rapidly changing society and upon all citizens to recognize the white cane as an instrument of safety and self-help for blind pedestrians on our streets and highways today and every day. Now you can hear me. All right, down. Rosie, down. I am Ted Goodenough. Rosie is my guide dog who doesn't want to down right now. Um, <laughs> but, you know, why is this day so important? Why is it important to um, pay attention to white canes? Imagine if you're walking up to a curb on Congress Street and you know you have to get to the other side and you have your white cane and everyone 
everyone's just driving by, and you've got a guy with a leaf blower over here, somebody wee whacking there, there's a lawnmower behind you. So now you're deaf and blind, and you have no way of safely getting across. Florida statute, um, what is it, 316.1301, states that if you, as a driver, don't give the right of way to a person with a white cane or a guide dog, and I'm going to tell you, this, this is the part that hurts, the wallet, $250 fine, two ticks, uh, three ticks on your license, and up to um, 100 hours of community service. It's pretty serious. Now, on a personal level, I was uh, using my white cane before I got rosy, and walking on a sidewalk, going to uh, the train to go to work. And it was raining a little bit, and a gentleman had stopped in a self-serve car wash to change his wiper blades. And uh, he came out and hit me with his SUV. I was not seriously injured. My wife says I was, but... Um, <laughs> And what she says rules, right? Okay. Um, but it, it did, it, it, it made me a recluse. I didn't want to go out by myself anymore. I didn't want to take that chance of somebody hitting me while I was on the sidewalk using a white cane. Um, I stayed in my house for about two years and then finally decided, oh, my, the company let me work from home. And... Then I just decided, you know, I can't do this. I have to go out and, and be a person. And so I got rosy, and now I'm back out, and I advocate for uh, service animals. I try and help people understand uh, what it means when you see a white cane, and I get to be an employee of the best city I've ever seen. Thank you very much. And our last proclamation for October is to proclaim October 2019 as National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Tricia Williams, Area Director for Best Buddies, and Dr. El Elsa DeGoyas, Disability Service Manager at Career Services, will accept the proclamation. City of Boynton Beach Proclamation. Whereas welcoming of the talents of all people, including people with disabilities, are a critical part of our efforts to build an inclusive community and strong economy. In the spirit, in this spirit, the City of Boynton Beach is recognizing National Disability Employment Awareness Month this October to raise awareness about disability employment issues and celebrate the many and varied contributions of people with disabilities. Currently, 81% of adults with developmental disabilities do not have a paid job in the community. We must do more to ensure that individuals with IDD have the opportunity to earn an income of their own, work in a, an environment alongside others in their communities, and contribute their talents and gifts to the rest of the world. Working closely with the city's inclusion support team, we will reinforce the value and talent people with disabilities add to our workplaces and communities and affirm the City of Boynton Beach's commitment to an inclusive community. Now, therefore, I, Stephen Grant, Mayor of the City of Boynton Beach, Florida, hereby proclaim the month of October 2019 as National Disability Employment Awareness Month. In so doing, I call upon employers, schools, and other community organizations in Palm Beach County and the state of Florida to observe this month with appropriate programs and activities and to advance its important message that people with disabilities are equal to the task throughout the year. We all play an important part in fostering a more inclusive workforce, one where every person is recognized for his or her abilities every day of every month.
I'm not going to take too long. All I want to say is thank you, thank you, thank you to the mayor and to the commissioner because I too live and work here in Palm Beach County and live in Boynton Beach and I will live in the best town ever. Um, disability services is so crucial for us to continue actually making a difference in people's lives. So awareness, education, and making this October month the awareness on disabilities, I can't thank you enough because we can't do enough to keep opening individuals' eyes in our employers in the county. So thank you. I want to give the floor to Best Buddies because they also have Ryan that wants to speak. Thank you again, Mayor and Commissioners and everyone present. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, good evening to the mayor, the vice mayor, and our honor commissioners. Um, my name is Trisha Williams, and I am the area director for Best Buddies here in Palm Beach. We cover from Palm Beach County all the way up to Indian River County. Um, again, I would like to thank you on behalf of Best Buddies International, our local office, our staff, Macy Ramirez, uh, our um, community engagement program manager. And uh, most of all, I want to take the opportunity to have one of our buddies who is actually a resident here in uh, the city of Boynton Beach. Uh, he is also employed with us. Just share a few words, please. Right. Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan, Ryan Hoffman. I am a member of Best Buddies. Best Buddies is a global volunteer movement for people with intellectual disabilities on one-to-one -one friendship, leadership development, and jobs. I was diagnosed with autism at the age of three. I also had had a speech impairment. As years passed, it, I started to progress by using the tools I learned it in school and at home with tutors, family members. My parents backed me up throughout my life. Uh, they've been supportive to me every day. I have over, over, overcome with challenges by changing and stepping out of my comfort zone by not limiting myself. When I, when I was in high school, it was quite rough for me. When I was a freshman, I was picked it on. There wasn't a best buddies around around then, which that made it uh, tougher. It was a very uncomfortable situation where I felt like I didn't belong in a setting where I didn't fit in. In college, I discovered the best buddies, which has helped me became more in, involved involved it than ever before. I'm involved it in the Best Buddies YRC Young Leaders Counselor, where the YRC works together with Best Buddies on how to keep the mission going throughout the lifetime. I'm currently a buddy director at FAU and job participant and, and ambassadors in Palm Beach County. I started my new job today at the Berman Law Group at Deerfield Beach location in Broward County as a marketing coordinator and social media working on computer data. I want to say thank you to Best Buddies Jobs Program and the Berman Law Group for having me on board by, by me being back in the workforce working and looking forward on the future with my new job at the Berman Law Group. Today, Best Buddies gave me the confidence I need to be myself and build myself up when things are tough. Like Pitbull says in his in his one of his songs, this is for everybody going through tough times. Believe me, Benner done that, but every day above ground is a great day. We remember that. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. That song's going to be stuck in my head now. <laughs> I know my rent was going to be late about a week ago. <laughs> Thank you, Billy. Go. 
Next, we have an announcement for the Climate Action Workshop for public input into the City's 2020 Climate Action Plan by Rebecca Harvey, Sustainability Coordinator. Good evening, Rebecca Harvey, Sustainability Coordinator. Um, so many touching presentations tonight. Yes. It's been really nice. Mine is short. I just have a quick announcement um, that the City is hosting a Climate Action Workshop on Tuesday, October 29th from 6.30 to 8 o'clock p.m. at the Boynton Beach Senior Center, 1021 South Federal Highway. The purpose of the workshop is to engage the community in the development of the city's new 2020 Climate Action Plan through an open discussion about how citizens and government can work together to reduce our community's carbon footprint and prepare for the impacts of a changing climate. The discussion topics of the evening will include alternative transportation, energy efficient buildings, renewable energy, trees and green space, waste reduction, and climate resilience. There will be light refreshments, and we will be giving away free stainless steel Go Green water bottles to the first 30 attendees. We have mini flyers up here. They have the earth on them. Take one if you have a friend. Tell your friend who might be interested in, in this topic. Um, we invite everyone, all ages, all members of the community to come and really want to get your input into this important issue facing our city and our planet. Um, if you want to talk more about it, you can find me this weekend. I'll be out at the Fall Festival um, at Intracoastal Park here <laughs> on Saturday afternoon. I will also be at Pirate Fest with the Sustainability Advisory Team when we were, will be there all uh, throughout the event, giving away Earth fans to cool off the uh, visitors to Pirate Fest. So stop by the Oasis tent there. You'll hear more about that coming soon in a couple weeks. Um, and if you want to learn more, go to gogreenboyntonbeach.com. You can email me at harveyr at bbfl.us. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions from the commission? No? Nope. Look forward to it. And then I had a couple other announcements. One also this Saturday at our Veterans of Foreign War post 5335. They're going to do a, a naming for Michael Metcalf. And that will be at start at 10.30, so I advise everyone to get there by at least 10.15. I believe there will be parking over at the Intracoastal Park Clubhouse. And then on Sunday, November 3rd, I will be uh, hosting uh, Boynton Cares over at the Intracoastal Park starting at 9 o'clock. We will be cleaning up, and hopefully I can get some surprises there. All right. Any other announcements from the board? Uh, Commissioner Ramos, do you have anything uh, disclosed for informational items? Yes, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to disclose that I met with Bonnie Miskell and uh, the related group in, re in regards to the property at the Boynton Beach Mall. That is all I have to disclose. All right. Thank you. Moving on to public audience, individual speakers will be limited to three-minute presentations. Please state your name and address for the record. Julia Collin. Hi, Susan Oyer, 140 Southeast 27th Way. First of all, I'm passing around the thank you notes for my student who came last time. Thank you for being so gracious to Gisette. Um, sorry, Vice Mayor, you were, weren't here, so you don't get a thank you letter this time. But you can see I have a bunch of students who are last, last possible extra credit for the term. So there's a whole bunch here tonight. So you guys will have a whole flood of thank you letters coming your directions. Um, I wanted to ask Commissioner Ramos, um, we are coming up to our sixth annual holiday decorating contest. For Seacrest Estates, if you could be nice enough, enough to judge for us this year. We've got Halloween coming up. Yay. Thank you very much, Commissioner Ramos. Um, I'd like to, I was unaware about um, Mr. Howard, and I want to express my condolences to everyone. He's a great man. I personally will miss him too. And I want to say um, I was out at the tree giveaway, and that went exceptionally well. And I think that maybe that means we need to be buying more trees to plant more trees. And I saw something nice that's floating around National Geographic today, and I thought I would share with you. Um, trees have been proven to um, secretly talk to one another by forming underground symbiotic relationships with fun fungi to re relay stress signals and share resources. So this is yet another reason to plant more trees, because it turns out they're actually talking to one another. So um, let's get more trees going in our city, canopy trees, not palm trees. Thank you so much. 
My name is John Welter. I am the chair of the Library Advisory Board for the Boynton Beach City Library. Um, mayor, Vice Mayor, City Commissioners. Uh, as the chair of the Library Advisory Board, I've been given the authority by the board to make a recommendation for your consideration. Um, we want to implement a fine-free policy for the library users of City of Boynton Beach Library. The Library Advisory Board has been discussing this issue in detail over the past few months. After extensive research and discussion on the topic, we've concluded that we should join many public libraries that are implementing this policy throughout the United States, and therefore we highly recommend that the City Commission changes their fine policy. Recently, we've learned that the Miami-Dade public library system went fine-free over the past year and eliminated more than one million in fines, thus removing access barriers from their library community. Last month, the Palm Beach County Library System announced that they would implement a fine-free fine -free policy as well. We are requesting that all materials be fine-free except for Wi-Fi hotspots and laptops. The latter, the laptops, will be made available for our community to borrow when the new library opens. To be clear that the board emphasizes the importance of implementing a fine-free policy on all other materials. Charging late fines is fundamentally counterintuitive to our public institution. Library users are a diverse socioeconomical group and many of our community would stop using the library because of an economic barrier imposed by our current policy. As a public institution, it's our responsibility to ensure that the library is accessible to all regardless of race, culture, and income. On behalf of the library board, we recommend to this commission the removal of the library's current fine policy. Thank you for the consideration. Thank you. Before he leave. Yep. You have some questions? Yes, I have questions. Uh, uh, Greg, please. This year, I'm just saying, you know, what is the total fines we have thus far? Um, we did a, a mini study of the past few years, and we're averaging seventeen to eighteen thousand dollars a year in late late fine collections. Is that collections or implementations? I'm sorry, what was the last part of is that? Is that collections or how much we're implementing in uh, collections? <laughs> so we have to. So for someone who doesn't come back with it, uh, if somebody doesn't bring something back, we we do eventually send them on to a collection agency and. The collection agency does try to uh, collect the material and have them bring it back to the library. So we will still have that service as well. They're very actually friendly collection agency too. Okay. In, in my, my next question, stay up there. Do we have a forgiveness policy here in Boynton? Um, what we normally do is uh, for, for new patrons, we will tend to forgive their fines the first time around just as a courtesy, their late fines, and then we just let them know in the future they'll have to pay them. Okay. Is this your first time hearing about this from your group? Um, no. We be, I I'm attend the meetings, obviously, as the, as the, uh, the uh, staff member who oversees the meeting and uh, works with the board. Right. Mayor, I think this is something that we need to kind of put it on, I guess, future agenda items to discuss. I'm just saying I'm in favor of it, but we need to get a little bit more information, sir. I'm, you know, I'm, Correct. I'm in favor of it. So do you know how long the, the programs have been going on in Palm Beach County, Miami-Dade? Miami-Dade has been going on for a little bit over a year, uh, and Palm Beach County just started it, I believe, <laughs> October 1st, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. But we're also we're also talking about kind of major cities throughout the United States. Chicago, just within the last two weeks, Chicago library system went fine free, and we're talking about late fines, um, not not you know the the not we're not returning books. We want to encourage people to return books, thereby prohibiting um, or, or enabling them to not pay a late fine. All right. It's about encouragement. Okay. All right. Thank you. 
once we get our new library, I'm just saying it would be much easier to return books anyway. So we're looking to it. I'm just saying, you know, because it's going to be a drop off. I'm just saying right now it might be difficult, but it's something that we need to put on future agenda search that we need to look at. Point yes. will take up on my part. Commissioner Ben Serga. Greg, could you give me a rough estimate of how much we're paying for the collection agency? I just want to make sure that the collection agency is not costing us more than what we it, might it, be able to recoup. Sure, I'll be happy to. Um, it's, it's actually, we charge the patron $10 if we send their account to collections, and we pay that agency $8.95. So it's a budget neutral service. For, uh, Commissioner Romulus. Chair, I think it would just be better again for us to put this on a future agenda item and all these questions would be answered at a better time with more information ready by the library director. So I'm going to make a motion if needed. All right. Second. Thank you. And uh, would you like to have the, the, do you need an ordinance or resolution? How does it, how do, how, <coughs> Figure it out. Yeah, I don't think it's established by ordinance, but we'll check it. Okay, and then you'll give us the the document, uh, the language for the the resolution or ordinance. Yes, all right, thank you, and thank you again for coming here. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you for the work you're doing with our library board. David Katz, 67 Bidwood Lane. On uh, September 20th, uh, thanks to the city, myself and two other board members attended the American Planning Association, the Treasure Coast uh, chapter. A planning workshop held at the city of Palm Springs. It was my fourth year. The other two board members, it was their first year. Uh, there was a lot of good things discussed. Uh, speakers, a fellow named Merle Bishop. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because the city is reimbursing me, so I thought it would be right to tell you what we did. Um, uh, Merle Bishop, who was, uh, got a very long resume, discussed planning basics. Uh, Susan Trevarthen, planning law. The city attorney might know, know her. Uh, there were three people from the county who spoke about sustainability in planning and the sustainability, sustainable economics. Um, I also participated in a panel with two other uh, planning board members, uh, Larry Sellen from the Boca Raton Planning Board, uh, Judith Thompson, the chair of the Lake Park Planning Board, and myself. We had about an hour and a half uh, panel called Perspectives of a Board Member. Uh, where we were asked questions by the uh, by the coordinator of the event and by members who the other there were about 50 people there we got about another 20 questions. What was interesting was is that one of the people asked me about an article that was in the newspaper saying that uh, the mayor had wanted to turn the uh, Boynton Beach Mall into an amusement center, and I said to him that um, you shouldn't believe everything you read in the Palm Beach Post. So um, that was pretty good. Anyway, we had a good time. We learned a lot, and, um, I, and I think it was a good, good job having us there. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Katz, thank you. I, I'm going to say, you know, once you people go away and represent the city of Board, and that's what I'm looking for, people come back and give us a report of what happened. Thank you. for My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Charles Hunt. 1330, Northwest First Court. U.S. Air Force retiree, Special Operations. Therefore, I'm used to fighting. I'm accustomed to it. But this fight, I need you. I can't do it with, by myself. I am working with uh, Andrew Mike, but Unfortunately, we haven't been able to uh, connect. Therefore, I'm asking you to get involved. Um, if you look at, it's, it's, it's a wonder, you know, for me to say, hey, I want, to, I want behind my area nice as well. When the whole community, I mean, Behind their house, Born to Beach Canal look well. But behind my house, the Born to Beach Net Canal look like something you don't want your dog to walk through. Uh, if you could take a, if you take a look on the west side of I-95, it's beautiful, Born to Beach Canal. But when you take a look on the east, northeast side of I-95, Born to Beach Canal look like 
I mean, I have scrubs growing up this high. And snakes and everything out there. I have kids, grandkids, you know, to play out there. But they can't go out there out of that fence. All I'm asking for is your help. See, now I was told that the uh, Lake Worth water is over that area. Worth drainage. But someone got in touch with, someone got uh, the church to clear up their part of the area. So you guys have a voice. See, I can't hit, I can't, I, I can't, me, I don't have a voice. When I speak, not many listen. But when you speak, everybody in Boynton listen. So I'm asking your help. Let's get something done. That's a bad sight for Boynton Beach. Sir, you know, I represent you. I'll see what I can get done, but I'm just saying the Banks Church, I'm just saying Boynton, the Bible Church of God, they cleaned up their own area and uh, from Federal Highway to Seacrest, I'm just saying we have a, a uh, park in there and I'm just saying, you know, for to say all of us, you know, but I'm just saying perhaps behind your house might look bad, not because it did not get done, but would contact the Lake Worth Drainage with Andrew Mack and see what can be done, I'm just saying, but you know, that was a group of people got together and said we're going to clean up our own property, so we need to see what they did and then see well, how we can affect, you know, do that. But I'm just saying that's something we need to contact Lake Worth Drainage and let them know that you do have a concern. Yeah, from, from behind my house all the way up to I-95. So, but once you cross I-95, oh my gosh. We hear you, sir. Okay. So uh, I, that is, is something that, you know, we will contact the Lake Worth Drainage District and then we'll also speak with community standards because even though it's, their property, it's still in the city of Boynton Beach, and they should have some standards uh, that we should keep them to that. That's right. And so we will thank you for be, uh, letting us know, and we will look forward to working with you and you. all the parties involved. And I will continue to work with uh, Andrew Mike uh, if I ever get in touch or get him, right. <laughs> well, we ever get connect. Why don't we have Mr. Mike get in touch with you? I'm just saying, give it to uh, our. He's there. Mr. Mike is here tonight. Yeah, y'all connect tonight. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kathy Klein, Fire Marshal with the City of Boynton Beach. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners, City Manager. Um, I just have an announcement. September, um, October 26, 2019. Um, the American Red Cross, Boynton Beach Fire Department, and the Neighborhood Officer Program is going to install smoke detectors in the community between Boynton Beach Boulevard, 13th Avenue, I-95, and Intercoastal. So we have 75 people from American Red Cross. We're hoping to get over 100 volunteers. It's from 8 to 2. We're meeting at Carolyn Sims Center. We'll be offering some lunch. So I'd like to have everybody come out for the smoke detector program and then go to Pirate Fest. Um, we have a, a flyers. Uh, we posted it on our webpage. Um, any neighborhood um, can sign up and make an appointment. And then we're also scouring the neighborhoods for anybody else who doesn't have the flyer. We were willing to install them. If they don't want a smoke detector installed that day, they can contact the Boynton Beach Fire Department and we can give them a smoke detector also. We have over 500 smoke detectors uh, donated from the American Red Cross for this program. It's no charge, right? There is no charge. Okay, there is no charge. It's something that slipped my memory, but I, they're not forced to take one if they don't want one. Correct. We will so install that for okay. them or, you know, we can donate one. And October 26, 8 to 2. And I don't care how much money you make, you can still get a free smoke detector? They're all free. No that's money. That's it's free, that's donated that's to the city. There's no charge. We're looking for volunteers. Um, we're meeting at the Carolyn Sims Center, 8 o'clock, October 26. Thank you. 6, October 26. All right. All right. Yes, Thank board, you. Uh, board member, Ron, Commissioner Romulus. Chair, uh, whatever, Mayor, um, you, you got me confused now. Uh, Kathy, first of all, just thank you for, for announcing this. And the last event you all did in the Forest Park neighborhood just was phenomenal and uh, went off without a hitch. And 
thank you again for now doing it in, the, in a different part of the community because I know other people were asking how can we get this around other parts of the city so thank you and um, you know just a little FYI because this is something that I learned so I feel like I've become a you know advocate for 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 um, smoke alarms you need one in each bedroom it's not just a one in your living room or one in your area, general area, one in each bedroom. So it's important for people to know that and to be educated about that. And when I learned that, that made me make my home a lot safer than it was because right. I thought I was okay with one. So The ones that we are donating have the 10-year battery. Um, and so they're a lot more efficient. Um, and we are installing them for free. So even if um, we have it in, in Creole and, and America, and we have a lot of volunteers coming out to help people who don't understand what we're doing. So we, if they don't feel comfortable with it, we can still offer them the smoke detector to be installed. Fantastic. Thank Is you. it one per household? Or are you doing the bedrooms too? There's no unlimited amounts. We have um, approximately 500 smoke detectors to offer for this neighborhood. Thank you. All right. All right, thank you. Thank you. Urban Sinaeus 223, Northeast 12th Avenue. How's everybody doing? Um, just uh, with the, uh, with the um, I guess, the grand opening of the Saracens Park approaching, which is a, a, a positive thing. Definitely looking forward to seeing what happens with that. There's just a couple of points of concern I wanted to bring up, and I don't know if they've been um, brought up publicly or answered publicly, so I was hoping to get some input. Uh, one was just concerning the um, amphitheater. Uh, I think we've spoken about this, but I don't know if it was answered publicly. Um, it was pitched during the charrettes and everything with Sarah Sims that it did be an amphitheater. Notice there's not one there yet. Just wanted to know if there was a um, a plan for maybe adding more to what's currently there as it was pitched to have like a performing stage amphitheater. That was what was pitched during the Sarah Sims, uh, I guess, input meetings and things like that. So I wanted to just input if there's, if it's not there now, is there a plan to increasing that or adding something to that? Um, the other thing, uh, the other question was, just concerning the um, ability to be able to have either concerts or things like that at the, at the park. Don't know um, what the policies will be on that. Just want to get some input. Why it's important if you're not sure. Um, it's important because obviously the community um, our community specifically is looking forward to being able to have that engagement, being able to have outdoor events, concerts, and things like that. That's another thing that just brings positivity. Um, and speaking on behalf of my brothers and, and the community and Boynton Strong, one of the things that we advocate for is just outreach and things that bring community together. So just wanted to know um, will this, how this park will be policed, how will we be able to engage with it as far as concerts, as far as things like that. Um, so I wasn't sure if these things have been addressed publicly. Just wanted to get some input on that. So, Mr. Mayor, you'd like to speak? Yeah. Um, so to answer your question, the there was no amphitheater in the original plans. What was added ultimately was a repurposed uh, amphitheater canopy, um, and that's what's there now. Uh, there are no plans currently to add to that. We had a discussion in a previous meeting, um, and there was consensus at this time to open the part, roll with what is already there, determine the usage level, and then from that point on, see in a future budget if there's an opportunity to allocate additional funds. One of the concerns raised by a number of residents in the proximity to the park was that it's a neighborhood park. They didn't particularly want loud music or activities, and to that point, we've had a prohibition on events in that park for a number of years because of some dangerous incidents that occurred a few years back. Um, that's a, I don't think it's on future agenda items, but it's been raised by this commission to revisit that prohibition on special events at the park with the new revised version of the park opening. Um, so there will be opportunity to discuss the potential for activities such as concerts and events, um, but to the the core of the question right now, there's no plans to expand or add to the uh, amphitheater performance pavilion is what we're calling it now to give it a more accurate name because there's been confusion about the scope of it. Um, so that, that is the status right now. And um, to the, the commission here, I believe that tonight we were supposed to have that discussion regarding uh, Sarah Sims uh, permit, um, however, I think it, it was, you know. Yeah, we, we, want it, we need to bring back to you uh, a discussion of 
whether or not you want to lift that prohibition, and, and if so, what? We, we uh, we'll put that on. The, we, I think, well, that's what I was just asking. November 5th, I think we had planned on it to yeah. bring it back? Yeah. yeah. Is, okay, I just want to make sure. It's under future. No, it's okay. not. No, it's not. No, it's not. It used no, to be. No, it's, and that's the thing. I'm looking. Yeah, it used to be. And I'm looking at the October 1st, and it was supposed to be on uh, tonight's agenda. So I'll ask uh, the commission is, do you want to have a discussion before staff brings us back so that we can give them some guidance of what this board wants to hear and put it on for new business? Yes, Vice Mayor. Um, I, I have no problem waiting until they've, they've got their analysis or, or input from the, the staff. I wouldn't want to, I would want to hold the discussion absent input from the professionals and, and then make recommendations that weren't feasible and get people's hopes up or let people down. So just personally, um, you know, I'd like to see it as soon as possible because the park is, it's already it's kind of soft open and it's going to have its, its real grand opening shortly. So we should get on top of that. Uh, so the sooner the better, but I, I wouldn't want to have a, a conversation prematurely absent the relevant facts from the city staff, the city police, because obviously they would be charged with monitoring the area during events and so forth. All right. And, you know, I'm in favor to have that discussion tonight because on October 1st, we did have it on our future agendas to have that discussion tonight. And so I'll ask the, any of the, if someone would like to make a motion to uh, amend the agenda to put it on new business. If not, we will speak about it hopefully on November 5th. Mayor, I'd rather have it put on the November 5th agenda um, simply because I don't want to necessarily bring it onto the agenda tonight with the expectation that staff hasn't given us anything, there's no backup, there's nothing to really discuss other than maybe perhaps our own individual uh, opinions on what we would want to see. So I'm okay with postponing it until November 5th, having staff bring it back, and then we can have a more thorough discussion. All right. So, Erin, I do apologize we're not having the discussion tonight. Um, staff will bring back us something regarding November 5th, um, the, the goal for Sarah Sims is to have it open as soon as possible. And because of the, the ban that is previously put on there, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. And so we want to make sure that safety is the number one uh, priority before we issue permits and have the types of events that you are talking about. Okay, well, I appreciate that. If I could say one more thing, like, because it's a fresh new park, it's an opportunity for a fresh new start as well. So some of the old stuff, um, I mean, we, we've seen in Boynton Beach, in those areas, that we can have um, a bunch of people come together, have a good time without incident, um, and we've seen that over and over and over again. So, um, you know, so just keep open minds and keep the fact that it's an opportunity to have a fresh opportunity between the community and the city, and um, let's just not disappoint if we can. Appreciate it. Thank you. Erwin, one, one second, sorry. Yes. I, I, I think it... It's important to mention that now that you have a heads up on when we will have this discussion, it's important to gather input from the community as well to see where people stand on doing this and what they want to see with that park moving forward. So as that discussion is had publicly here, I'm saying it's important for the community, whether they agree or not, to be present, to voice their, voice their opinion. Yeah. Minister Bernard Wright. CEO of Bernard Wright Ministry of Real Talk Radio and the Robert E. Wells Foundation, 713 Northwest 2nd Street. I don't know why we keep dickering and bickering and going through these debates about what is ours, the park, neighbors. I live two houses down from the park. I don't know where, uh, 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 Mr. Katz, you are seemingly taking a protagonistic, a leadership position and speaking against what we have advocated for, and you are inputting things that is not true. There was never almost anything in the original plan of what we have now. All it came about, and I was at every community meeting before you became a commissioner, and we were talking about a water park that I advocated. We got all the details of the downside of a water park, so I advocated about an amphitheater that would also bring wealth building into our city. Now, we're talking about paying homage to entertainers and celebrities that used to come that now we have an opportunity to come. Thank God for such a beautiful park that we have. And let me tell you something. There's nowhere on the face of the earth, probably especially in the continental United States, they haven't had some gun violence, even in the mall. But it still goes on. Life goes on. Why would you stigmatize us to the point because of somebody we had no responsibility of having or uh, doing something to the uh, point of you all Closing this park, a shooting, wasn't a death. The boy done gone to the penitentiary back out, 
two junkets and did what they did. We're not responsible for it. Life goes on, man. Don't stigmatize us as though we're still with a slave mentality. Let me explain something to you. There are two commissioners uh, right now piggybacking what we're talking about, completing this amphitheater. You changed the name to a... Uh, uh, a, a, a provision, a, a performance provision, because I called it a fancy provision. You know, we talked about a, uh, uh, to God be the glory, a cultural center. In 214, I brought it. You always seem to take and steal from us, but you're giving us a cultural center down in what we call White Town, Town Square. It's still the same. Nothing changes in respect to location and our perception of the division of our city. To God be the glory. This is a city, it's broken up in four districts. It is an interest of the whole city, but each district you have to have the interest of the people that you need to be voting in, in favor of, not against. You don't even come to the park. You probably never walked in the supermarket, I mean, the, uh, the mini markets there. You don't go to the park, but you got so much of a concern for my people down in this historic, cultural, wonderful city that I have such a great stake in as I run for city commission of District 2. Let me tell you something, man. I wish our commission would get on board with us because it's not upsetting no one's quality of life to have music, music, the soul of music. To God be the glory, man. Come on. We're talking about a prophetic spirit of being better. How are we going to be better when you still with a negative attitude, speaking negative stuff? We'll have what we say. That's a spiritual principle. I say we got better in Boynton. To God be the glory. We got all this security. We've spent all this money. You want to spend a million dollars for something over here, but you're hollering back. If we get some more finances for $30,000, less than that, Mr. it would take Wright, the poor 12 you, you, foot of concrete, have, 3 foot of concrete. To God be the glory. You got something you want to say? Yes. Your time is up. Well, it is, but I know one thing. Addressing folks means everything in the world, man, on an issue. Then thank let you, them go and don't you. feel like they have been thank heard. Thank you for your comments. Bless God. Y'all ready? It's in the midst. And we're not going to stop when we get a stage. Mix. We still have a meeting, Mayor. Um, I promise all positive comments. In spite of the fact that Reverend Wright, whenever he's not getting his way, comes in here and attacks everybody, I do respect that he is a passionate member of the community. To his question, where do I live? I live in the city of Boynton Beach, just like he lives in the city of Boynton Beach, just like everyone on this commission lives in the city of Boynton Beach. And it does not matter to me where something occurs. It's important to me, equally as important as where it happens. Um, I look forward to the park opening. I support what Irwin spoke to, which was revisiting the prohibition um, and setting up some opportunity to allow events at that park. So in spite of a number of mischaracterizations and personal attacks, I will be supporting opening the park up to special permits, and I look forward to this park and its revitalization and the help that it will bring to the community by providing this new opportunity. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to speak before we move on to administrative? Seeing no one at the, admit, uh, at the podium, we will, public audience is now closed. Moving on to administrative, we appoint eligible members of the community to serve in vacant positions on city advisory boards. We have uh, one regular position open on the Arts Commission. We have two alternate and one regular appointment available on the Building Board of Adjustments and Appeals. Um, education Youth Advisory Boards, we have three applicants. Um, and uh, Crystal, if we move up uh, someone from regular, from alternate to regular, would that mean there would be two positions available for alternate? Yes, there would be, yes. Sir. Okay. So I would like to move up uh, Shakira Young from alternate to regular on the Education and Youth Advisory Board. Second. All those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes unanimously. Vice Mayor Katz, you have a position for alternate. Yeah, I'll nominate Vanola Rada. Second. All those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 And I'd like to nominate Francoise Calis Dioville. Did I get that name right, Commissioner Romulus? Dioville. Second. Uh, for the, the opening alternate position. All those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes unanimously. We have one alternate position available on the Historic Resource Preservation Board. We have a regular and alternate available on the Library Board. And we have one alternate position available on the Planning and Development Board. Uh, Commissioner Penserger, it is your vote. 
Yes, Mayor, I'd like to nominate Jay Sobel to the position. Jay brings over a decade's worth of experience in planning and zoning from his hometown, former hometown of Summit, New Jersey, four of which he served as chairman of the board. He serves in numerous organizations. And it doesn't hurt as chair in the top. He has a PhD from MIT. I think he will bring a worth of experience and knowledge to the board. All right. Second. <laughs> okay. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes unanimously. We have two regular and one alternate position available on the senior advisory board. Moving forward to appointing a voting delegate for the National League of Cities City Summit. I believe myself, Commissioner Penserga and Commissioner Ramos are uh, attending that. Um, I'll be happy to be the voting delegate unless one of you... Second. Stop, stop, stop. Yes. Discussion. How many votes do we need when we go there? One or two? Or just one person voting? Just one person voting. Okay. All right. Move on. All right. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Moving on to consent agenda. Would someone like to pull any of the items on consent agenda? A. Yes. You'd like to pull item A? Yes. Proposed resolution number 19-108, approve and authorize the city manager to sign a first amendment to agreement with James D. Stokes to increase the hourly rate of special magistrate services for the city's red light camera program. I want to know what the initial, I'm looking at it quickly, but what was his original wage and what is he asking for it to be increased to or what are we proposing for it to be increased to? Good evening, Mara Fredrickson, Finance Director. His original wage was $140 an hour. He's asking for 200 Can you say that loud? Uh, yeah, please. Sorry. What? Say it again. His original wage was 140 and he's asking for 200 and he asked for a raise probably a couple years ago. Back in 2017. And it was denied by the commission. Um, Jim, you, we were going to look at other rates. Did we get any other rates from other people? The 140 rate is comparable. Uh, the 200 Currently? rate is, would be on the high end. Yeah, okay. And so this is, and so what happens if we don't have a magistrate for the special, uh, for this, red light camera hearings well to conduct code compliance hearings you'd have to revert back to a board well this is the magistrate for red light camera i'm sorry for red separate light. yeah separate magistrate yep. um we they're they're hard to find we would have to go back out i think we did like a letter of interest a few years ago and asked for you know and legal helped us get the word out to see if there's attorneys that are available and interested to do this we had two the second one we had stopped I don't want to say quit but went on to other things um, so we would just need to do that that would take some time so we might have to try to find an alternate in the interim if and so we don't have a second one like we used to mm -hmm. no. and all right so board, Commissioner McRae then Commissioner Pinserga Thank, thank you. My take is that going from 140 to 200, that's a hell of a jump. I'm just saying, you know, I'm willing to go at 175 and stop there. I'm just saying, you know, get somebody fine, you know, halfway. Right. Vice Mayor. I would support that compromise counter offer. All right. Board Member Pinserga. I will support the compromise, but I do want to ask a question to staff. My understanding is that originally the 140 per hour rate was set under the understanding that there would be two magistrates. It was required to meet the demand. But this person is now doing the work of two people in one, and it is not a doubling of the cost. Right? So I do support the compromise. I think this person deserves it if he's doing the job of two people in one. And I think even with the increase, we have experienced a decrease in the fees because they've gone from two hearings to mm. one hearing a month now because they've got they have a good system down. Good. So we won't experience that, a spike in the, in our costs. It'll neutral out. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, I was looking at the expenditure. He works, was it, forty hours a year, 
and if it's one meeting, so it's maybe three or four hours once a day. So um, I guess I'll take a, a motion to uh, amend for one hundred seventy-five dollars. Discussion. Okay. Um, as stated by our city attorney, the one hundred forty is comparable. So I'm still not comfortable going up to one seventy-five. I'm I'm either comfortable with staying or moving somewhere closer to one hundred forty. All right. I'll entertain I'm going off a motion that we go to $175 an hour. Second. All right. I don't believe your statement was a motion, uh, Commissioner Romulus. We have a motion and a second on the floor. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. Motion passes four to one. Any other item on the consent agenda? Motion to approve the remainder. Thank second. you. Second. All right. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Consent bids and purchases over 100000 Would someone like to remove one of those items for discussion? Uh, resolution RN19112. Okay, item A. Uh, proposed resolution number R19112. Authorize the city manager to sign a contract with Kilbrew Inc. of Lakeland, Florida for scope of work that includes pre-chlorinated pipe bursting of the potable water mains on Northeast 1st Street in the amount of $702,794 plus a 10% contingency of $70,000, $279. If it needed for staff approval of change orders for unforeseen conditions for a total expenditure of $773,073. My question is, how long will it take us to, you know, complete this project? I would say um, 60 days, roughly, from the notice to proceed. Sir, so I can hardly hear you. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's the My name is Joe Paternity, Utility Director. And the answer to the question, uh, Commissioner McCray, is approximately 60 days from the notice to proceed. Thank you. You answered my question. My, qu my questions are, is, you know, is Northeast First going to have to be closed? Uh, for this because I'm, I'm sure the, the pipes are under the road and is there going to be a decrease in water pressure for the homes around that area? Uh, the answer to the question, there's going to be some um, road closures for this. There's going to, it's going to be uh, in situ, which is a pipe bursting operation. There won't be any open cuts except for the connections to the existing crossing pipes. And uh, so there will be some disruption there. There will be some boil waters for that construction process in the That's, neighborhood and so we'll put up door hangers for that absolutely okay we're getting good at it uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> what did he say we're getting good, good at it, good at it. <laughs> all, right. all right and so yeah i know that i'm looking forward to seeing the, the new water pressure there thank you yes Sport, commissioner romulus i would also go on that vein of just communication is there a 800 number or a number that they have directly to staff we'll be uh uh, informing the neighborhood by direct mail and uh, door hangers before we start the project. And throughout the project, we'll have information okay, available. Good. Sounds good. Thank you. I believe you made a motion, Commissioner. I made a motion. <coughs> all right. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion from the board? Seeing none, all those in favor state so by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes unanimously. We have a motion for the remainder of the consent agenda. Of or over 100,000. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor state so by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Public hearing. The City Commission will conduct these public hearings in its dual capacity as local planning agency and City Commission. Item 7A, approve request for a new site plan to construct one story, 1,989 square foot professional office building and related site improvements on a 12,822 square foot vacant lot located at the northwest corner of Northwest 7th Court and Boynton Beach Boulevard. Applicant Joni Brinkman of Urban Design Kilday Studios. Um, do you mind if we do this along with the proposed ordinance 19-038 and 039? Joni? We only have one. Okay. Those are separate items. Those are separate items? Okay. With item A, this is a quasi-judicial. Anybody who intends to testify, raise your right hand. 
Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. <laughs> Joni Brinkman on behalf of uh, Urban Design Kilday Studios um, and OFS Holdings, the owner of the property that's the subject to this application. Um, we're before you tonight here to ask for approval for to allow the construction of a approximately 1,989 square foot office building. The building's proposed to be located at the northwest corner of Northwest 7th Court and Boynton Beach Boulevard. This aerial gives you an idea of the surrounding uses in the area. To the immediate west of the property on the north side of Boynton is an existing medical office building. There is an existing single family home to the north, which I'll talk about buffering a little bit later in the presentation. Um, to the east of the property, there's an existing um, office building as well, professional office building, and then to the east of that is the existing win drive through Wendy's restaurant. Stop, stop. If you need to talk in the mic. I'm just saying there's an existing, okay. what you said, Wendy restaurant. Wendy's drive through restaurant. Okay, you got to keep talking so I okay. can hear you. I'm going to vote. Uh, just to go over the site plan in a little bit of detail, um, the building will be situated closer to Boynton Beach Boulevard, complying with all your setbacks as provided in your code. There'll be a buffer along Boynton Beach Boulevard approximately 10 feet in width and 6 feet on the west side with some additional green area there associated with an existing utility easement. There'll be a buffer along Northwest 7th Court with the only access to this site and to the parking lot in the rear of the building off of Northwest 7th Court. On the north side of the building, where it's adjacent to the existing residential structure, per your code requirements, we're proposing a 12-foot buffer. In the middle of that buffer will be a 6-foot wall. And um, I do want to point out, we did make a presentation to your Planning and Development Board earlier in uh, last month. And um, they did have some concerns they expressed about making sure that those residents were adequately protected by mitigation in that area. And we have agreed to a condition of approval to add additional plant material on both sides of the wall so that the canopy, when it goes in at installation, will form a barrier above the six foot to provide additional um, buffering to the neighbors to the north. Um, the on-site garbage collection will actually be um, via a tote rollout, similar to the existing office building on the east side of Northwest 7th. Um, while this project is less than 5,000 square feet in size, we did want to point out that we did make efforts to, to promote sustainability in the project. Uh, some of those include the um, standing um, metal seam roof. We're providing, providing LED outdoor lighting fixtures in compliance with your lighting restrictions so that it, they are shielded and, and uh, prevent overflow to the adjacent neighbors. 100% of the plant material being proposed is low to medium watering demand. We've also specified plant material that, that promotes your um, butterfly garden plants. Um, we've, right now we're proposing four different species. There was um, a request at the board meeting as well to, uh, for us to consider an additional species, which our landscape architect is looking at now. We are having an on-site recycle bin as well. Uh, we are also, even though we are only required seven spaces, which is what we're providing on this site due to the small size of the office building, we are voluntarily proposing to provide one electric vehicle charging station as well. And then finally, at the request of staff and actually in, in agreement with our client, um, there is an existing bus stop in front of this, this vacant lot today. It consists of a bench and a sign. We have agreed that we will provide a 15 by 7 foot bus shelter easement there and construct an actual shelter that will be consistent with the design of the building. Um, we are in discussions right now. We understand that about your art and public places program as well. We're considering how we're going to wrap that into the design. We haven't yet finalized that, but the bus shelter may be a really good opportunity to do that. This will give you an idea a little bit of the architecture. Our architect is here if you have any specific questions. But um, it shows you the south elevation there uh, facing Boynton Beach Boulevard with the entry doors there. We'll have a handicap accessible sidewalk access from Boynton Beach to that side, as well as the east elevation. 
Is that all? Okay. The north elevation, uh, which is faces the uh, residential, we do have some signage on that. However, we are accepting a condition of approval in that regard as well, that we will not have any illumination on that sign to make sure that we don't have any negative impacts to the surrounding residential area. And then on the west elevation, it's, um, that faces existing commercial, so there will be no signage on that side. That concludes my presentation, actually. Um, the, just for a little bit of history, though, the user of this building, OFS Holdings, um, owns various real estate holdings throughout Palm Beach County and some other, actually, in the, in the, in the city itself. Um, he plans on using this for his personal office. Um, he is designing the interior that in the future, if he wanted to sublease to a second professional office user, he could do so. But he's excited, actually, to have a brand new office to come to every day. It's a family business. And um, he's been a, a owner of property in the city for quite some time. So looking forward to building a brand new structure um, on Boynton Beach Boulevard that will be attractive to the city. That concludes my presentation. Yes. Another way for the mayor to call. Yes, over. Board Member <laughs> Cray. Commissioner Cray. Thank you. For, first of all, in regards to your bus, bus shelter, did you, have you contacted Palm Trend in regards to doing anything with the bus shelter there? Um, there was coordination that took place with Palm Tran during the um, site planning process with the city, and that's what resulted in, um, actually, I think initially we had a 5 foot by 15 foot. They asked for another 2 foot of depth in that regard. So, yes, we have been coordinating through the city with Palm Tran. Next is, uh, was the citizens around there, were they contacted? Um, we did not reach out to the citizens. However, I know that they were noticed and the site was posted. Notice and site posted. Yes. I'm just saying, let me ask staff, was they supposed to send a, anything out to them stating that there was a building going to be built there? You, if you have been searched a search, certain radius, we had to notify them by mail. Correct. Was they notified by mail? Let me ask that question then. Yes. Okay, that's what you should have said yes to. That's what <laughs> I was asking. Okay. All right. Yes, Vice Mayor. Um, I just want to thank you and your client for being proactive and hitting on a, a great number of things that typically are asked for on, on projects of any size, but for one this small, uh, to incorporate so many things, the electric charging station, the rehabilitation of the bus stop. Um, that site, if you drive by it, is kind of most prominently known for being used for illegal curb stoning and parking of cars for sale, so that will cease once this project moves forward. So, I, I, again, I appreciate what you and your client are putting together, and I support the project. I, if I'll sell for four, four butterflies. You don't have to give me five. I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> All right. And so? Mayor, I'd like to motion to approve. All right. Second. Is there any uh, further discussion? Is there any discussion from the audience? Seeing none. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> now we're moving on to Ordinance number 19-038 and ordinance number 19-039. Jim? An ordinance of the City of Boynton Beach, Florida, amending ordinance 8938 by amending the future land use element of the comprehensive plan for property commonly known as bird property and described herein owned by B, B, and R, LLC, changing the land use designation from Palm Beach County Industrial to Industrial Providing for Conflict, Severability, and an Effective Date. I'm going to read both. Yep. Ordinance 19093, uh, 039, excuse me. An ordinance of the City of Boynton Beach, Florida, amending ordinance 02013 to rezone a parcel of land described herein is commonly referred to as the Bird property from Palm Beach County Light Industrial District to M1 Light Industrial District, providing for conflict severability and an effective date. All right. We have a presentation. Yes. Thank you. Ed Brees, uh, Planning and Zoning Administrator. Uh, the property on the screen, I know it's a little small there. I'll try and it's a little bit bigger, but this one gives you more location. This is the immediately south of the post office property on Boynton Beach Boulevard, west of Congress, behind the uh, public shopping center. This uh, 1.89 acre parcel was uh, annexed via an interlocal agreement with Palm Beach County back in 2010. The current use, and I'll go to the other screen, 
as you can see, is a uh, storage facility. Uh, the uh, future land use uh, designation as it exists today uh, still has its Palm Beach County uh, land use designation, which is industrial. What we're proposing is to change the uh, land use within the city to industrial, so it matches what's in the county currently. And uh, as far as rezoning, we're, uh, it is currently in Palm Beach County light industrial. We are looking to zone it to light industrial. Uh, be consistent, keep the uh, project uh, conforming uh, with the regulations it's under right now. And staff recommends approval uh, based on the comprehensive plan position to retain and increase industrial designated uh, land within the city. And I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Yes, for, uh, Commissioner Romulus. What's the size of the parcel? She I'm sorry? Said, she said, tell me to talk now. What's the size of the parcel? 1.89 acres. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so, Ed, I got a question. So this is a city initiated because the, the property that we got annexed in does not necessarily meet our city's zoning? It, what happened was uh, we uh, annexed a piece of property immediately south of this that the uh, school board owns. Once we did that, did that, this became an enclave, and we were able to work with Palm Beach County through an interlocal agreement to annex this parcel in. So it was a city initiated. It was not something that the applicant came in and applied for. It was something that was done through legislation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so does this mean they'll start paying city taxes? Uh, they already are. They've been in annexed in since 2010. We're just looking to now change the land use and zoning from the county designation to the city designation. Again, it'll be the same designation it was in the county, just under the city. Okay. <coughs> All right. Is there any discussion, further discussion? Yes, Commissioner Romulus. Now it begs the question, what took so long? What took so long? To change the designation if they were already technically paying yes. our city property taxes. Because it was a city initiated annexation, there was no requirement to change the land use and the zoning at the time. At that time, there was some discussion about the, uh, whether they would have to hook up to the sewer at that point in time, at the time of annexation. Uh, we held off and the regulations have changed. They do not have to hook into the sanitary sewer until such time as they redevelop the parcel. So now is the time to go ahead and make that change. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve? So move. Second. All right. Uh, uh, ordinance number 19038. Any further discussion? Seeing none, may I have a roll call, please. Commissioner Romulus? Yes. Commissioner Pinserga? Yes. Mayor Grant? Yes. Vice Mayor Katz? Yes. Commissioner McCray? Yes. Vote is 5 0. For ordinance, ordinance number 19 039, we have motion to approve. So move. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, may I have a roll call, please. Commissioner Pinserga? Yes. Mayor Grant? Yes. Vice Mayor Katz? Yes. Commissioner McCray? Yes. Commissioner Romulus? Aye. Vote is 5-0. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Moving on to city manager's report, provide a brief update of the, uh, on the art and public places program. Notice it said brief. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Debbie Coles to Bay, public art manager. Yes, I promise to be brief. And uh, there is a lot to see of public art in the city. So the best way I thought to be brief was just kind of navigate you a little bit through our website. Um, you'll see it's an updated, clean, very easy to use website. It's also very handy to use on your um, smartphone and it will tell you all about what's going on in the city. So let's see if I can get this activated. The first thing you'll see is our mission, purpose, vision, and our successes on the landing page. You can get straight to the landing page by going to boyntonbeachearts.org 
or you can certainly go through it through the city website and find art in public places. Um, so if you see these different areas, um, colorful, beautiful pictures, tours and events, this takes you straight over to the city page, which has all of the tours and events that happen throughout um, our city at any moment in given time. The exhibition page, um, I briefly spoke to you about what was going on for Avenue of the Arts. So if you click on this button, you'll go straight over to the page that really tells you more detail about the um, Avenue of the Arts, the new Color Effects exhibition with Cecilia Luisa. It also gives you the tour dates of when you can um, go and visit and sign up for a docent-led tour. Public art projects. I'm going to click on that one because this uh, really is the area where it showcases um, all of the different public art projects in our city. And um, as you can see, I'll give it a moment here to catch up. Um, the first one would be the uh, projects that occur in our town squares. So these are the new conceptual projects that are happening in the city. So I'm going to click on that briefly. And what you will see there is um, projects like the Cape Hog Park Courtyard and Eco Garden. And that's by Lucy Keshevars. And this was created by input of several community groups as well as multi-generational uh, creative sessions for the past two years. So if you go here and click on this, I'm not going to do that. You can do that in your time, in your own time. But that will give you much more information about what I just said in two sentences. Then we have Reflections, which is the iconic kinetic gateway feature by Rafonso. And I think you're pretty familiar with that uh, major kinetic project. Synesthesia is an interactive plaza that's by Don Garanella. And this is um, a sound and light interaction for all ages and all abilities. And then you go over here to the reef. Um, this project we're hoping to get funded through um, a naming rights and things like that. We don't have funded yet. But this, again, would be another fun play for all ages and all abilities. And this would be in the Children's Schoolhouse Museum. And then we have here the um, building community. And this is the police courtyard project, the conceptual one for the, the project. And this is underway now. Um, this is by uh, BJ Krivenek. And again, it's police. Um, it's on the police plaza. So one, one area you walk and you see certain words that connect to the community and connect to the police services. So Stop right there. Sure. Will that be protected? I'm just saying for, you know, for some idiot to run into, I'm just saying, you know. Yes. Very good question. Uh, from the parking lot, we have large planter boxes are made of cement. So you can't, it, it's part of, instead of having ballards, we're having a much more creative, much more beautiful way of protecting the courtyard from people running into it. Yes, thank you. Um, the next one is uh, the Deep Ocean and Shore Reef, and this is on the South Parking Garage, and this is by Amanda Johnson. She was one of the um, artists who we incorporated into our Emerging Artist Program, so she learned about doing public art this way and having the garage manufacturer that's going to actually build it and fabricate it. And then lastly is called Community Heartbeat, and this is by Lynn Doyle, and she again was another one of our Building Wealth um, a, um, emerging public artists. So at the bottom of this page, you will see also everything in completion. You'll see the whole master plan. You'll see where everything's located. And you'll also be able to see these stars represent where Avenue of the Arts will continue once this um, project is built out. So I'm just going to go back to the next page. And um, the other thing that you will see on this next page is um, if it gets there, it's a little slow because we're on uh, Wi-Fi. But we always have a button and a location for the International Kinetic Art Biennial, uh, which will be coming up next year. So we're preparing for it another whole year from now. And then the uh, event will be in February, first weekend of February of 2021. So we always kind of keep that active and play with that. Now this also showcases, this is a map. So this is a very interactive map where if you're out and about and you see a location, you're not sure if this is a public art project in our city, you can certainly click on this area. We've divided it out, as you can see, a north, central, downtown, and south point. So if you want to see public art anywhere in your city, you just go to one of these areas, which is indicated on the map, and then you see these um, 
these places where it kind of gives you, if you click on it, it gives you more information about where exactly that is and what this project is and who, and who created it and what year. So what we're doing here is we are promoting our private development projects and we're also showcasing our uh, city projects as well. And then I'll go back to the final areas. Oh, the one thing I do want to mention is we also are doing maintenance on three murals and five different artworks. So we have a very active maintenance program as well. So lastly, if you were to click on this area, this is for development. This takes you over to the development page that talks about you know, the, the support and why the reasons why aren't in public places. It also helps you to connect you to the process. Um, so that's more information. And then the get involved, that's always important. You know, we talk about getting people uh, ve um, involved in the Arts Commission Board or even as a docent for our volunteer program. Um, so that's basically it. That's all I really wanted to kind of show you. All the uh, things are detailed out here in, in more detail than you can ever imagine, but it's very simple and easy to reference everything. So do I have any questions? Debbie, thank yes. you for your work. Um, is there a place for young children and families to be part of some of these experiences? I, and the reason I ask is we have two elementary school principals in the crowd today. Is this something that those age group can be a part of? Absolutely. Art experience? Yeah, absolutely. Public art is for everybody, all ages, all abilities, I mean, and, and multi-generational. So absolutely, all these artworks are for them to see, to be inspirational for them. Um, there's interactive ones, like if you go to JC Park, there's a whole way to learn about how, why we have mangroves there and the importance of, of our waterway um, historically present and into the future. So there's a lot of educational components of this as well. Fantastic, I'll connect to you all. Thank you, anybody else? Thank you. All right. Moving on to new business, our first uh, community support funds request is by myself to distribute $200 uh, to the Smith Smiles, Inc. I don't know if they're, oh, they are here. Thank you for waiting. And so do you have, uh, would like to tell us a little bit about your organization? You gotta move the microphone the down. Right down. <laughs> Hi, we're Smith Smiles. We donate toys to children in the hospital. And this is my sister Grayson and my brother Zachary. Um, I was in the hospital when I was younger and I noticed that all the toys were either broken or they had missing pieces. So we started donating to hospitals so that the kids could have something to play with while they're in the hospital going through their procedures and things like that. And, and then um, it grew from there until becoming a nonprofit in summer of 2016 and it's run by us and my amazing parents are here um, oh. <laughs> and so far um, we have since becoming a nonprofit we have donated um, over 11,000 toys in 18 different states and one donation internationally in Israel and we hope to keep growing and keep expanding, and so we can put more smiles on the children's faces. All right. Well, I have a question. Yes. The toys you're donating, you donated any in Boynton? Oh, yeah. Uh, we have donated to 18 states and one international donation. Well, for local, I mean, we've done everywhere in Florida from south to where Grayson had her first surgery in Miami Children's all the way up through <laughs> Tallahassee. So. We've donated all over um, from, we were just at um, it off Seacrest Boulevard, um, the Bethesda, Bethesda, Bethesda yesterday. Bethesda. Um, we did Jupiter yesterday as well. So we, we call around to see where they're in need of it. And now we're starting to get calls. 
where people want toys and they see us on social media and things like that. So we try and circle most in Palm Beach County and you know South Florida because that's where we're local. Um, and then anytime we go on vacation, like we were in Tennessee a year and a half ago, half our car is toys and then there's our luggage and our wheelchair and things like that. And then we'll ship to places or us locally. So Florida is our main concern because it's where we live. Um, and on our website, smithsmiles.org, you can see how many times we've repeat customered, we try and call it, um, where we continue to go back to the same places again and again and again. We don't want to just drop and go. And things, you know, yes, we want to expand, but we want to continue to go back to the same people again and again to continue to bring back. We don't just do it at the holidays. We do it year round. Right. I appreciate what you're doing. I just wanted to hear that you was doing something here in this city. Yes. Thank you. That's Absolutely. That's my question. Because that's where we live. <laughs> Better than that. Mm -hmm. All right. So. To approve. All those in favor state so by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, motion passes unanimously. Congratulations and thank you for waiting. Thank you. Sorry, everybody. They're getting there. All right. Moving on to item 10B, approve the request of Commissioner Pinserga to distribute 1,000 of his community support funds to Citrus Cove Elementary. We have Dr. Natalie Cromwell, the principal of Citrus Cove Elementary here, and a guest. Thank you for being so patient. No problem. Hi, good evening. Hi, my name is Natalie Cromwell, and I am the proud principal of Citrus Cove Elementary School. Um, we are a school that services students in pre-kindergarten pre all the way to fifth grade. And one thing that's very special about us is we are a STEAM school. And I just would like to thank first Commissioner Pinserga for reaching out to our school. And he came and visited me over the summer as I took over the school as the principal. Also, um, I was very um, surprised about, I had a wonderful visit too from Chief Gregory as well. So the support of the community of Boynton Beach is very important to our school community and knowing that you're reaching out to us as we are also in partnership with you. And with that being said, the teachers and the staff and the students at Citrus Cove Elementary, we truly feel, feel your support. And we would like to sincerely thank you for considering to um, donate $1,000 to our school the funds will be used to provide a research-based phonics program for our first grade students. Currently, all of our kindergarten students are receiving Wilson Foundations, which is our phonics program that we utilize. We would like to expand that to our first grade. So we would like to utilize the funds in order to purchase some of the materials that we'll need for our teachers to be able to implement this amazing program to give our students the foundational skills they need to learn and be successful. So we just uh, really appreciate your consideration. Uh, how many students do you have in first grade total? In first grade, uh, about 160. How many in the, the school altogether? 1,070. Yeah, so we that's, have a very large school population. That's the school Judy Asbury was principal of. Yes, it was. Okay. We're all kids blossom, so we're very proud to be there. And I have an amazing staff and student body. I'm going to support it, but, Penn, but Commissioner Penn Server, you're trying to spend up all your money. You're going to get elected. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Do I have a second? I will second that. Okay. All right. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, item 10C, approve the request of Commissioner Pinserga to distribute 1,000 of his community support funds to Freedom Shores Elementary. We have here the new principal of Freedom Shores, uh, Michael Sabatino. Yeah, this is my, I'm going into my second year there. I started last summer. I'm fortunate enough to, to meet everybody there. And uh, Natalie thanked everybody. They all came to our schools too. Thank you, Chief. Um, and I appreciate it all. Um, we're also, uh, going to use that $1,000 donation that we're requesting. Um, we got beat to the punch. A guy in Jupiter already um, donated money to pay off the, uh, the debts of the uh, students in Jupiter. But we came up with the idea before he came on the news. Yes. And so we did have it first. Way we back didn't in the get it. We didn't get it across yet. Um, we're going to use the money to pay off the, uh, the outstanding debts of the students in the school. Um, it is a 81% free and reduced lunch school. 
So we do have a, a lot of the student debt there. And this debt sort of, um, though it'll only impact them in elementary school in the sense that they don't get um, the choice of the lunch once they read a deficiency, once they meet a deficiency of $6.15, which is about three lunches. Um, then they're offered just a turkey and cheese sandwich with no options. They get, um, you know, the milk, the juice, and basically that's it, a basic lunch. So they do eat, but they don't get their choices. Um, the debt will then follow them through their years of school and impact them when they get out to high school with the uh, diploma and, and graduating high school. That's when the debt really impacts them and they feel it. Uh, so with the donation, we would be paying off the, the debts of the students. They'd start with a clean slate, and um, we'd be able to then offer all the students the choice of the, um, the hot lunch that they could have. Um, we send letters home with the students so they then will get the free and reduced lunch form also because, I mean, it's always given out, but sometimes the parents don't fill it out, don't complete it correctly. So we're sending them out. They'll be able to fill those out and, and then qualify for the free and reduced lunch, hopefully. Uh, so that's what we plan to do with the donation, and we hopefully uh, we can, you know, support all the students that need in the school. I, I have a question. The guy in Jupiter said they only get a cheese sandwich. You're saying turkey and cheese now. They, get, they do get turkey and cheese in Palm Beach County. I think he was wrong on that because I did check this with my, uh, with my cafeteria manager. It is a turkey cheese sandwich. Okay. Not the most tempting thing in the world, and the kids don't get any uh, choice on it, but that's what they get. Motion to approve. Second. Um, all those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passed unanimously. Congratulations. Thanks, sir. And Mayor, I just wanted to one commend Commissioner Penserger for his contributions to the schools and then also the two principals. Um, I've heard nothing but positive things from them during their tenure at those two schools and the fact that they're both uh, in Boynton Beach only makes me happier that they're the leaders. So thank you both for your service and thank you again, Commissioner Penserger, for your contributions. Are you campaigning? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Commissioner Romulus. Mayor, I, I would, this is, has nothing to do with the uh, individuals. I, I was just saying, in terms of formatting our agenda to help with preventing having people f being here for, you know, hours waiting to just receive their funds, can we move these agenda items in the future to maybe perhaps just after announcements? Uh, I, I think it's also important, too, for these nonprofit organizations to also kind of get a little bit more buzz about what they're doing and have more people in the audience when they're speaking. So would, would we be willing to entertain that as a board? Um, the only, I'd like to, I, you know, we could probably put it under administrative. And I, yeah. I think that's is one of the, the better places to do it still before <laughs> consent agenda. And that way it will be within the, hopefully the first hour of the meeting. Right. You, you don't need a motion, do you? No. no. no I think it, we got a consensus though from the board. I appreciate the idea. Yeah. All right, moving on to legal, proposed resolution number 19-115, authorized mayor to sign a non-exclusive ground lease with FH Quantum LLC to construct a parking lot for Quantum Eco Park to serve the parking requirements for a 60-acre park. We have a motion to pass. So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion from the board? Seeing none. All those in favor, states up. Oh, we have Any one. input from the public. It feels like one of those items that maybe. <laughs> so do you, for this non-exclusive ground lease, are we going to see what the, was it the architectural design before they actual construct? Uh, yes, that will all come back because it's, it, it's in the park, so that will come back to you for consensus uh, through that design process that we use. This is just the first step. And how long is the ground lease for? I don't recall. Uh, if someone has in the audience has the answer, because I think we should know if it's permanent or. Who's yelling at what? Hold on. And Andrew is here. Thirty years. There we go. Say your name. Andrew yeah. Mack, Director of Public Works. Yeah, Andrew for the win. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. Any further discussion from the board? Seeing none. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Oh, there's two additional terms for 30 years? You didn't mention that. So it's, it's a 90-year ground lease. If we 
agreeable by both parties, right? Yeah. And we have to agree to it. No, it says the lessee. All right. Whatever it says, let it go. Gee. All right. Moving on to resolution number no. 19037. No, nope, nope. wait, 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 we got something in the resident? middle there. Nope, I was looking at the wrong There's page. Authorize the city manager to just continue further negotiations for a lease extension for a portion of Mangrove Park and vacate the leased area, which will revert back to the Diocese of Palm Beach. So moved. Second. Uh, the discussion that I have is that, you know, I heard that the, the park has been closed since July, and I've not gotten any complaints for it being closed. Um, the only thing that I do think we still need to have discussions with the diocese is removing the boardwalk there um, because we need to figure out what's going on with the, the, the structure of the bathrooms that is there and what exactly is going to happen with the, the mangrove park. I'm pleased to see that you know it was nothing there because some of the, the pictures that were saved um, and now we have actual mangroves there and I'm very happy that the city was able to help our ecology in Boynton Beach uh, because the mangroves are a vital part of our ecosystem and I'm going to miss it. Um, I have so much fond memories of walking Daisy there and uh, I hopefully that uh, our staff can find better uses for that aluminum bridge because I think a walk through Mangrove Park is something that our residents have the access to because you can go to, what is it? Green K or Loxahatchee, uh, but what we had on the Intracoastal was something special, and uh, hopefully staff can figure out how we can get something special there again. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor state so by saying aye. Aye. And so, proposed ordinance 19-037. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Boynton Beach amending Chapter 18, Pension and Retirement of the Code of Ordinances to create a new Article 11, Deferred Retirement Option Plan, providing for uniform deferred option retirement option plan benefits for all city employees, amending conflicting provisions of drop benefits contained in the general employee fire and police pension plans, providing for delayed implementation to accommodate collective bargaining, bargaining or waiver of bargaining, providing for codification and an effective date. Um, I have an odd request on this one, and that is simply that tonight that the commission amend paragraph O to add the following sentence, effective for sworn law enforcement employees hired on or after 10-1-2019, and for fire rescue employees and general employees hired on or after 10-1-2020 uh, as an introductory clause there. The reason we need to do that is from we got some feedback from the actuaries regarding clarification of that section, and we cannot submit uh, the ordinance to the state until it's in its final form. So only the amendment would be done tonight, and then I would ask that you table second reading of the ordinance until the next meeting. All right. So may I have a motion to amend? Where are you adding this language? Line 91. Line 91? Okay, I didn't hear okay. him. Uh, Vice Mayor. Mayor 91, Section O. Just a Vice Mayor. point of information on that. The copy I have, I don't know if it's different digital. I have the, the physical copy. The second date says 10-2020, yeah. 10, not 10-1-2020. We have one that says 10-1-2020. Okay. <laughs> Motion to approve as amended. Second. second. This will come back for a second. I believe the request. Just a motion to amend. And motion it will come back no. for a second, second reading. And then if that passes, then a motion to table okay. second reading. All right, we have, I have a question. We have a question. Hi, Julie Oldberry, Director of Human Resources and Risk. Just a point of clarification. I believe the date for the general and the fire was supposed to be 1-1-2020. One, one, okay. January? Not, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's because we need time to get circle back with them. We've already chatted with PD about it, the, the, C, the bargaining process. We need to circle back with fire, and we're actively negotiating now with SEIU, so I need till January to get that finished. January 1st, 2020? 20, next year. Okay. Just the three-month difference. So they'll all be done pretty much at the same time. And, Jim, I just want absolute clarification. I'd like to hear it from you. This does not affect current employees, but only hired thereafter. 
That's correct. Okay. Current employees or employees already in drop hired before the dates that were just stated uh, would remain as originally stated in the um, in the pension code, right. which is the fixed 7%. All right. Thank you. I just and want to make sure it, it is what I understand it to be. And are they allowed to keep their money in until their death? No, I think they remove it. We have them removing it. Yeah, the language it's being removed. has a provision for removal. Once you retire, do you have 45 days to remove your money? And that includes people currently in the drop? No, no. The, no. The people that are in drop are... Don't get touched. Right. But the people who have an election under a certain system. So the people who have not elected to be in drop yet will be required to take their money out, or are there at seven percent? They to keep their money in. People that are hired after these dates will have will be to be required. To Only new hires. My, my big concern is that we cannot really allow the city to be be paying seven percent on people's money in the drop in perpetuity, or you know, not until their death. This is. It can, it's compounding exponentially, doubling every 10 years. So if someone enters the drop and lives another 20 years, that means they're quadrupling the funds and the city is required to still pay the 7%. You know, you're shaking your head yes, and that's kind of unattainable. And so I don't know what the, this board thinks, but you know, for the future of our city, we need to have kind of that line that says if you're not in the drop that you can either have the the seven percent and be required to take the money out after or be on the variable rate because this is not something that you know we're going to foresee but any saving that we're having in the pension right now with the, the concessions can be easily overrated overrun by this drop provision um you know and so we don't, because everyone has the opportunity to be in drop, Lori? Um, if you meet the requirements of 30 years of service or 62 years of age, That's depending on each plan is different, but you have to meet the requirements to then enter into drop. And so I thought it was 20 years, because that's when the, the pension's fully. I don't want to misstate. I know general employees, it's 25 or 30 years. Line 53, Jim, maybe that might be helpful. It's not stated in the yeah, bottom. not stated here. That's oh, this is participation to be exercised. <clears throat> in the first 30 years of combined. So that means after 30 years, before the end of the 30th year, they can enter the drop for another five years. And that they have to be a certain age to be entering into the drop. back to you because I think police and fire is sooner as well they don't have to do 30 years to go into drop they're going to be 25 but human resource she needs to come up here and tell us what's yeah. going on she's sitting there shaking well, we're trying to go off memory it's a little tough it's three memory nothing plans. I'm just saying we the each, this each of the um, plans has a different requirement currently the general employees is 30 years so it's <coughs> years of service or meeting an age requirement so general is 30 years of service or age 62? 62. 62, thank you. And then um, police and fire are, I believe they're the statutory um, languages. I think they're 25 years of service and then age 50 on police and age 55 on fire. So I'm sorry I don't have those documents in front of me, but that's Sounds the best of my remember. recollection. Yeah. And there's also in that an employee who is out of drop can take loans from their drop account and then pay it back to get the 7%. Is that correct? I don't know about that. They can so. take loans. It says on all item 84, less any outstanding loan balances. Yeah. So that's why I'm asking, are they allowed to take loans from their drop and then put it back in? and not have to pay the, the income tax on it because it's a liability, not income. Mayor, I don't know. Um, you know, the pension boards operate separate and distinct from the city itself. They're represented by their own council. I don't represent those boards. And I mean, uh, we don't do the actuarial, actuarial calculations either. Those are done by 
actuaries retained by the boards. If you need answers to all those questions, this is going to be tabled anyway when you're done with this amendment. Okay. And uh, we could ask for alternative information back through the boards to the actuary to uh, advise you as to those calculations. See if they can take loans from their drop accounts. Yes. And that they don't get interest on it, but they're not, but they can put the money back in and not, it's not a withdrawal. So, all right, board. Well, Mayor, okay. I believe your original question or concern was regarding if we want to move forward with having current employees who are not yet in the drop be able to do maintain 7% for their life. So is that a question that needs to be answered now or do we need to make that amendment now or is this something we need to have? Well, we, it's coming back for second reading, but you know, let's look at, you know, we we have I don't think you've gotten the number of all the number of, you know, what exactly is the city paying in interest? per year for all employees in drop or who are retired. And uh, I think that's something that we need to have that discussion. I know that's not necessarily collective bargaining, um, but we need to figure out what exactly are we paying retired employees because there's no annuity that I'm aware of that pays 7% are, and we are running the risk that if we have a down year, paying 10% interest on accounts of people not working here. Vice Mayor, then Board Commissioner Benzerga. So a point of clarification on my original motion. Um, the motion would be to approve the amendment to the document and then as you stated to then table the document until a, a future meeting. Okay, so I just want to make clear that 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 will be my motion, or that was my motion, however I had worded it. Um, to the, the discussion about the drop interest rate, um, just personally speaking at this time, I think that pension reform is a sticky issue. Uh, there's a collective bargaining process in place uh, to address it and any other uh, benefit uh, or working condition afforded to employees. And I think that while any number of reforms could be proposed. Right now we have a set of reforms on the table that have been tentatively agreed to or are about to be tentatively agreed to and I personally don't support circumventing the, the collective bargaining agreement process and deviating from what's been a, an established course of action that the, the relevant unions and staff have, have tentatively or are about to tentatively agreed to. So I, I would not support anything outside of the language that's already being presented to us personally. Yes. Um, Mayor, I just want to state my position on this. I am unequivocally opposed to changing the drop program for all current employees, whether they are vested or not. If you've been here seven years, if you've been here eight, nine years, I do not want to pull the rug under your feet. Uh, this is what you were told. This is what you've <coughs> been expecting. I will not entertain any discussions on changing current employee drop program. For new hires, I am in favor of what has already been agreed to in the contract bargaining meetings, which is the variable for, for everybody hired thereafter uh, the first of this month. All right, so uh, I guess the only information that I'd like for next meeting is, is that what is the total amount of funds through all of our three pensions that are in drop that, you know, each of those funds are required to make their, uh, what is that called, to make those payments and the city is required to make up any missed payments. So what exactly are those funds, what is the amount of interest that those funds are paying, whether it be the general employees, the fire, and the police for the last three years is the, the information I'm requesting. All right. All those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none. Motion to amend. It passes. Mayor. Yeah.
staff, can y'all do something about the AC? It feels like an icicle in here. Like an icicle. Well, no, no, no. One or the other. It's, it, when the, the room was fully crowded at the beginning, yeah. it was fine. And then once everybody left, they took away the body heat. And so, I, I, you know, I it's... I can't move. My fingers are yeah, icicle. My nose is... Here. Do that again. You're moving. And so I just want to clarify, we'll have the, the Sarah Sims discussion the next meeting, November 5th. Okay. Any for second. Meeting is adjourned.